Hello, New Jersey. Uh, I'm Aaron Viles with the Electrification Coalition, uh, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the Electric School Bus Policy Roundtable, which we're excited to bring to you with the support and collaboration of the World Resources Institute. Uh, you'll be hearing from our partners at WRI soon, but before I turn it over to them, I wanted to note how grateful we are for the help of many folks who've helped design this roundtable specifically for New Jersey. Uh, and as we start, I want to recognize that this past year and a half has been a struggle on many fronts. We're still working our way out of both the economic and you know, physical and social upheaval that's touched us, touched us all. Uh, you know, when this roundtable was first envisioned, we had hoped to do it in person, but we are encouraged by the significant commitments that are being made to electrify our transportation sector at the state and federal level. And I don't know if there could be a more exciting time to be convening this stakeholder group uh, to discuss the issue of school bus electrification. So uh, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we, have, we did uh, launch a poll, so hopefully everyone's had a chance to vote in that poll. Uh, and as you can see there, uh, you know, what motivates individuals uh, to go EV uh, seems to be predominantly protecting the environment, cleaner air, though I was glad to see some folks realize that actually you will save money, uh, uh, you know, charging your vehicle on domestically produced electrons as opposed to uh, uh, oil. And uh, some people understand also that, that it's a superior uh, technology and it's a lot more fun to drive a quiet instant torque vehicle. Uh, and you'll hear from school bus drivers who echo that as well uh, later in the day. Um, and then I think this is really uh, an, an interesting one, uh, despite being a very low number of vehicles on the road, uh, we've got, a, uh, a, I believe the correct answer is 25% uh, of, uh, of the US transportation emissions are from medium and heavy duty vehicles. So they have a big impact. Uh, and then electric school buses have been shown to cut emissions as much as, I believe it's 50% compared to diesel school buses, uh, although that does depend on the grid, specifically where your, uh, where your fuel is coming from. Uh, and then as we look at what, uh, what are the biggest challenges, uh, we, a neck and neck with the lack of sufficient charging infrastructure and the upfront cost of the vehicles. Uh, and I think that uh, folks definitely uh, nailed it uh, in terms of what we are running into. So I'm excited to hear other thoughts about how to get across, uh, you know, get, get over those barriers. And we'll have plenty of time to do that today. All right, so uh, moving on to the next slide. Great. Uh, oops. Just figuring this out as we go, folks. Um, all right, in this round table, we'll be spending the next few hours hearing more about how we can all work together to accelerate New Jersey's electrified school bus future. Uh, and while we are focused on school buses, there's not any nap time or recess included in the agenda. I hope we didn't intend for any nap time. Uh, however, we do plan to exercise your brains. We expect to all learn a lot during our time together. Uh, perhaps some sort of NTI, I guess, if you think about it. Uh, and while we won't be providing monkey bars, we do encourage you to stand up, move around as needed, keep the blood, blood flowing during the webinar, because I know we do have a long uh, day together uh, on, um, uh, on Zoom. Uh, and please do uh, let folks know we've got the settings so you can share your name, share who you're with. Uh, and so we get a sense of, you know, what is this, uh, what is this amazing turnout look like? We've got over 200 folks registered, uh, which really is a wonderful response. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from all of you through the course of the day. But let me do a little bit of general housekeeping uh, to help everything run smoothly. Uh, before we really rev things up, um, you know, while we can't uh, get folks to say anything in person, we can't turn on everyone's screen. I do appreciate everyone sharing their information as they log in. So if you're just coming in now, go ahead and share your information in the chat, who you are and who you're with. Um, and we will record and post this video to share later along with any slides, uh, but the afternoon breakout sessions will not be recorded. So uh, speaker bios are linked in the agenda and we will send those links out before each session in the chat box. Also use the Q&A function 
uh, for any questions for the speakers. We'll get to as many as we can. I think these are pretty tight sessions, so we don't necessarily have a lot of time for Q&A, but we'd love to, to, to get at some of them for sure. And if you have any problems, things aren't working for you at all, uh, please chat privately to EV Tech, uh, the Annie right there, uh, and she will respond to you uh, as quickly as, as possible. Uh, she is keeping a lot of plates spinning behind the scenes right now, but she'll be as responsive as she can. Uh, and uh, additionally, uh, you'll see some social media handles there. Please do feel free to you know, let folks know what you're learning, uh, sharing uh, and tagging folks as, they, uh, as we move through the day. Follow Electric Roadmap uh, and eSchool Bus for Kids to hear, uh, you know, amplify what we're saying and, and um, looking forward to hearing from folks through that survey that we will email out along with uh, links to all the supporting material. So, all right. And, all right, so as you'll see on this slide, uh, we have an amazing group of speakers that really represent the broad opportunities for electric school bus adoption. You're gonna be hearing from leaders across government, private and nonprofit sectors, and they're gonna be sharing insights on the market, how to integrate equity considerations into uh, electric school bus efforts, what's already underway in New Jersey, what's on tap for the future, uh, and how we can learn from early adopters around the nation, what policies can help take us to where we wanna be. Uh, so it really is, uh, I'm really proud of this, of this lineup and I think we're gonna learn a lot and we appreciate all the speakers uh, being with us today to offer their ideas uh, and suggestions. All right, uh, we want to hear from you throughout the day. Uh, I don't know why my screen wants to go two slides at a time. All right, uh, so uh, at the end of the day, as I mentioned, we'll be breaking into small groups. Uh, this is, uh, there's a new meeting link to use to register. And when you enter, you'll be prompted to select one of four issue areas. Uh, we're going to go into funding and financing, uh, policy and regulations, uh, operations and procurement, uh, and then local support and engagement. So in those kind of issue areas, if you've got interest to learn more or if you've got some expertise you would like to share, either is appropriate, but we're really looking forward to hearing your ideas. So as you listen today, speakers, please you know, capture your light bulbs and be ready to share your insights today at 1.30. And I know it's a little bit of a hurdle. You gotta you know, register for a new meeting, use a new link, but please do uh, to go to go that extra mile so we can get the most out of this time together. And till now, it's our turn to share a little bit about who we are at the Electrification Coalition. If you're not familiar with us, we're a national nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization. And we're dedicated to uh, accelerating the adoption of electric vehicles on a mass scale across the United States. Uh, the EC is motivated by the need to reduce our oil dependence and the related energy and national security risks that that dependence empowers. Uh, our team is now two dozen strong. We've been growing uh, like wildfire over the past two years. We are located all across the country uh, with a range of expertise uh, and focus areas. You may know the transportation sector is 90% dependent on oil. With electric vehicle technology providing options for every segment of the industry, this does not need to be the case. It's good news for energy and national security, but also for improving air quality, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This is particularly important given that the transmission, I'm sorry, the transportation is the single largest source of America, uh, sorry, New Jersey's greenhouse gas emissions. And it's actually more than double the amount from power generation. New Jersey has done a good job uh, uh, in terms of where their energy is coming from in terms of emissions, uh, power plants getting cleaner, you know, the shift to uh, renewable energy happening at a kind of faster and faster timeline, transportation will need to do more uh, to both meet the you know, climate change needs uh, and to just keep pace with what we're able to do. So how do we electrify transportation? One vehicle, one fleet, one city and state at a time. Uh, we all need to do more. There's opportunities at every level. Our policy work spans the local, state, and federal levels. We've developed and led some of the most visible and award-winning programs that you can see pictured here. Through our Climate Mayor's EV Purchasing Collaborative, we've worked with Bloomfield, uh, Jersey City, and the New York, New Jersey Port Authority to support their commitments and procurement 
in order to electrify their fleets as part of a nationwide effort. Uh, we've also worked to create new innovations in electrification with communities around the country. Uh, and in fact, one of our first forays it was in Rochester, New York, uh, which through that uh, accelerator community approach tripled the average adoption uh, EV rate. Uh, we're also piloting a freight electrification effort, working with uh, Nestle, Meyer, uh, very significant food and beverage and grocery companies uh, regionally and across the country to look under the hood on how best to advance electrified trucks and delivery vans, because as we mentioned earlier, uh, medium and heavy duty uh, make up a huge percentage of emissions. Uh, last year, we launched our state EV policy accelerator to help build on these efforts and to seize the opportunity for state policy action. And that work has provided, has proved we can get to electrified future and we've helped show the way. An important indicator of the strength of the EV market is the dollars flowing in from the private and public sectors. And to date, we've seen over 500 billion in global investment with some 55 billion in new investment over the last quarter alone. A big chunk of that is expected to land in the US to support growth and development on our shores. Uh, we are also encouraged to see the heightened interest in electrification uh, at the federal level. The, the president set a goal to electrify the entire fleet of federal vehicles, some 645,000 vehicles. Uh, he's seeking support for uh, half a million new EV chargers. And meanwhile, Congress is looking to expand tax credits for vehicles, charging infrastructure, and to support, very importantly, manufacturing and battery development uh, here in the United States. We need those supply chains to be here close to home uh, and able to provide for this growing market. Uh, but the growth needs to happen. Uh, we are, uh, we're at 3% now and need to, need to expand. We've got some uh, wonderful facts to share with you specifically about New Jersey and school bus electrification in uh, the Garden State provided from our uh, friends at Atlas Public Policy. Uh, but as we start on the conversation about electric school buses, why do we care? <laughs> why are electric school buses such an important uh, area to focus on? I think one thing is that they're just very well suited uh, to be early adopters uh, in the shift to EVs. Uh, they travel consistent routes that rarely exceed 100 miles. There's time to recharge between their routes. Uh, this proximity to vulnerable populations are kids, uh, and they're very well suited uh, with their kind of predictable timelines for vehicle to grid integration. Uh, so really excited about the opportunity. Uh, and uh, I think as you'll see, uh, it's growing. Uh, there's more and more opportunities in terms of what's available to transportation managers uh, at that uh, school level uh, and the prices uh, you know, are certainly not equal to a diesel internal combustion engine, uh, but we are seeing them come down. Uh, and as you see, what's really exciting is the trajectory of the total cost per mile uh, for EV school buses is clear. Uh, so right now you would spend more uh, over the life of that vehicle to have an EV school bus, but we pro project by 2030 that price is going to drop well below a diesel school bus, uh, and that is going to provide benefits, you know, finan clear financial benefits without any sort of externalities being, uh, being you know, factored in. So that I think is uh, really exciting and important. Uh, and of course, what's really important is to have that, that delta, that current delta addressed by some funding source and public funding for electric school buses is on the rise uh, through the Volkswagen settlement, through, if you actually look at this, the pie there, uh, you know, full half of it is from California investments. So California has, I think, pioneered a number of programs that can help fund EV school buses. We should certainly look to some of their more successful uh, endeavors, but right now in, you know, and we'll hear more about this later, the kind of conversation in DC, I think very much sets us up to continue the increase that public funding to make sure that the, you know, despite getting an operations uh, benefit, that capital expenditure at the kind of front, uh, front of the, uh, the, the procurement is addressed as well. Um, 
really important to, to, to tackle that and tackle it effectively. Uh, and of course, one element in this kind of potential partnership is what are utilities doing? What resources can they bring to the table to help make this happen? And we're seeing some early uh, examples of different options, uh, whether it's Con Ed's efforts to uh, bring uh, vehicle to grid school buses online in White Plains uh, using those batteries during the summer months. Uh, and then the bus operator receiving uh, some compensation for that use uh, or Dominion's model, uh, you know, investing in the school buses directly and, um, you know, using them again uh, to try to match uh, and encourage additional uh, investment from the state. So, uh, you know, we know that it's a partnership to get these school buses out there. I think the folks that we have in this Zoom today are some of the most important stakeholders in that conversation. Uh, and so uh, let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> let's have the conversations, hear from you. And right now I wanna turn it over to, uh, to my friend, Justin Malik with uh, WRI. Thank you so much, Aaron. Of course. So, uh, hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here uh, in partnership with Electrification Coalition for this convening. I wanna join Aaron in thanking all the participants who take, took time out of their uh, busy day. Thank you for being here with us for this really important and special conversation, bringing this uh, unique group of stakeholders together. I also wanna thank, um, local environmental advocates and industry folks and other stakeholders that we've consulted with along the way for lending their time and expertise to this event and our overall work in New Jersey, folks like Environment New Jersey, folks like New, uh, folks at the New Jersey Sierra Club, Environmental Defense Fund, League of Conservation Voters, other folks that we've talked to along the way uh, as we've gotten up and running. So thank you for lending us your time and advice and input and expertise. Um, and thank you to all the speakers for making time to join the event. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, World Resources Institute broadly, who we are, and why we're starting to work on electric school buses as a key initiative of the organization. And I will not take too much time because I know we have uh, an exciting list of speakers that are, that are more interesting to hear from, but we'll just uh, do a little bit of an overview of, so folks know who we are and what we're up to. Uh, and why we're here. So uh, World Resources Institute, for those who have not heard of us before, is a global research organization that turns big ideas into action at the nexus of environment, economic opportunity, and human well-being. That is our mission statement. And we advance that work globally uh, across seven different program areas. We have a cities team, uh, a food team, a climate initiative, uh, we also work on forestation issues, energy issues, and we also have an oceans team. And the exciting thing about our work on electric school buses is we're drawing from a whole host of uh, teams across our organization uh, to advance this work. And again, we are a global research organization. We have experts working across 60 different, more than 60 countries. Um, and this project is focused on the United States, specifically our electric school bus work, but this gives you a little bit of a sense of where we're working and the reach of our organization around the world. And so why are we focused on electrifying the US school bus fleet? We know that we electrification can accelerate decarbonization as, we, as Aaron talked about while bringing direct tangible benefits to every community in the United States. And we're focused on the need to electrify and those community benefits. And we think both of those are important to keep front. So we know that electrifying school buses specifically will lead to improved health and cognitive outcomes for our kids. We know that we can achieve cleaner air, especially in high pollution corridors and communities of color. We can achieve potentially over time reduced operating expenses for school districts and we can create new jobs and green manufacturing. We think school bus electrification will help reach us reach a broader tipping point for overall medium and heavy duty electrification in the country. 
And as folks will talk about more today, there's the potential for enhanced resiliency and uh, integration into our energy grid with vehicle to grid technology. So we're excited about the potential there. Our overall aim of this work is to electrify the full school bus fleet. It's an ambitious goal of our uh, of World Resources Institutes to electrify the entire US school bus fleet by 2030. We know that's a very uh, far reaching and expansive goal, but we are committed to doing the best we can to get there in partnership with communities, school districts, industry experts, manufacturers, utilities, and policymakers. And th that's why we're excited to gather this group and groups like this uh, going forward. So we know that there are 480,000 school buses in the United States and again, our, the new electric school bus initiative at WRI aims to work with communities all around the country to achieve full electrification by 2030. And again, want to emphasize that we are very focused on ensuring an equitable transition by focusing on frontline and environmental justice communities where our work uh, centers equity and that's important to keep in mind throughout as we embark on this conversation together. So how are we organizing this work at WRI, which really kicked off in uh, late last year, early this calendar year? We're focused on ensuring an equitable transition to electric school buses around the country by working with stakeholders on the ground. And these are some of the key stakeholders that we've identified. And there are plenty more, but these are the key ways that we've organized our work. Uh, we are providing on the ground technical assistance to school districts working with fleet managers and others. Uh, we are convening manufacturers to look at supply chain issues, battery issues, and other uh, industry issues in terms of uh, scaling uh, the assembly of school and manufacture of school buses and bringing the cost down over time. We're focused on utility engagement, and we'll hear more later about why that's such an important piece of the program uh, or of the effort and uh, where utilities really come into play. And Aaron talked a little bit about that already. We know that federal and state policymakers, plenty of whom we're gonna hear from today, have a key role to play. And so we're focused on engaging with uh, the federal government and with state policymakers around the country to uh, move forward on equitable electric school bus policies and local communities. This has to be a bottom-up push that comes from the local level. And one of our breakout groups later today is focused on building local support. Um, more broadly, our view is that we can make this transition and that we can't not make this transition. We know that electric school buses, according to some research that we've gathered, if we electrified the full school bus fleet, we would reduce greenhouse gases in the United States by eight megatons per year, and we would reduce overall bus emissions by 35% annually. We also believe we would see reduced operating expenses annually for districts. Overall, on average, we believe that there would be savings of $2,200 in fuel and $4,400 in maintenance costs over time on average. And these are some of the health and equity impacts which we've talked to about already, but uh, just to drill down on that even further, school buses produce nearly twice as much soot per mile as a tractor trailer truck. Uh, kids, talking about the health of our kids again, riding on diesel school buses are exposed up to 12 times more particulate matter and air toxins inside the bus compared to ambient levels. And we know that there are documented impacts on respiratory health and academic perform performance from that exposure. Additionally, uh, and very important to keep this front and center, the burden of air pollution is not shared equally. 70% of low-income students take the bus compared to 50% of non-low-income students. And we know that exposure is higher for Latino residents, for Asian Americans, and for African American residents overall in the country. And we know also that children with disabilities depend on school buses and often ride longer than other kids. We are clear eyed about the challenges that we face uh, making this transition. We know that there are higher upfront costs for the time being, and that that's something that needs to be tackled for school districts. Uh, right now, on average, the, we're seeing that the price of a new electric school bus is higher. Uh, the upfront price is three times higher than that of a traditional school bus. We also know that infrastructure development takes time 
and costs a lot of money and that uh, school districts have a lot on their hands already. As Aaron alluded to, we're still in the middle of a health public health crisis and school districts have a lot on their plate transporting their kids safely and uh, dealing with just the day-to-day -day educational needs of the student population. Additionally, we know that there are myths that folks that are out there about the technology and where it stands. One, two that we've heard are range issues that can these buses really go where they need to go and can they operate in cold weather? Uh, we understand that today's technology that electric school buses can operate in 90% of the routes that are out there. And we know that they've been deployed already in cold weather situations uh, like in Minnesota and in other places. So we are uh, clear eyed about some of these challenges, but we also know that uh, the technology is here and we can start deploying it. And there is a need to scale quickly to start tackling some of these climate issues and health equity issues. And here's just a little bit about the status of electrification in the United States right now. 480,000 school buses in the United States. They're 80% of all buses nationwide. Less than 1% of them are electric. And again, here are some of the benefits to greenhouse gases and uh, in terms of potential reductions if we were to successfully electrify every school bus this year. And Here's a little bit of where they're deployed to date. We know that electric school buses are in every, there's, um, it's less than 1% of the fleet right now. So we have a lot of work to do, but they are operating in every type of community, urban, suburban, and rural uh, throughout the United States. And these, this is um, a little bit uh, as we wrap up here and get into introducing our speakers. Um, a little bit about some of the organizations we've partnered with to date as we've undertaken this work at WRI. Um, these partners, uh, including Electrification Coalition, our partner with this event uh, and convening today, are working with us on everything from convening stakeholders, policy research, advocacy, uh, program development. And so we're appreciative of all the partners who have uh, joined with us to achieve this goal to date. And we're excited about the opportunity to continue to work with uh, even more partners and stakeholders on the ground in places like New Jersey. So with that, I think we can start to introduce our first speaker uh, and excited about that. So I will turn off my presentation and we'll get to the lineup. So our first uh, speaker today, this is really exciting for me because I'm a proud alum of the uh, Phil Murphy administration, um, is uh, New Jersey's first lady, Tammy Murphy, and excited to be able to introduce her today. Uh, I'll just say a few words briefly and then turn it over to her. Uh, over the years, uh, Tammy Murphy has worked with nonprofits, a think tank, and other organizations and as in her capacity as a first lady and as a active community member before that. Um, she's been focused on the environment, education, healthcare, youth and family services, as well as the arts. And as first lady for New Jersey, her policy initiatives have focused on infant and maternal health, climate change. She has uh, chaired the governor's council on the green economy. Uh, she's been focused on education and fostering women-owned businesses throughout New Jersey as well. Um, I used to work for the State Economic Development Authority, and she worked with our agency to increase angel investing in women-led businesses. And so she has been an active uh, member of the administration, a real leader on some key initiatives, and in both, as I say, an active first lady and an activist first lady in every sense. And so it is just a pleasure to be able to introduce New Jersey's uh, first lady, Tammy Murphy, to kick us off this morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Justin, I thank you for your introduction, um, as well as your prior service and incredible work at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. 
Uh, I have no doubt that you are missed by your colleagues there, but I really look forward to great coordination between the World Resources Institute and our administration as New Jersey moves full steam ahead um, as a leader of the climate movement. Uh, the title of today's program, Electric School Buses, the Opportunity for New Jersey, expresses literally perfectly our administration's perspective on our state's transition to a green economy. Every policy change, initiative, grant, and discussion originates from the view that this work is brimming with opportunity. Opportunity to preserve our health, our natural resources, and our lifestyle opportunity to advance social justice, and of course, the opportunity to achieve equity by creating jobs and wealth that benefit every community. Uh, Governor Murphy understands that successful climate action requires a comprehensive, intentional, and collaborative approach across all levels of government and economic sectors. As we seize this opportunity together, we are not just positioning New Jersey as a national leader of the climate action movement, but also we are creating a lasting green economy that works for all New Jerseyans. To this end, uh, the governor created the New Jersey Council on the Green Economy, which I have the honor of chairing and which is developing the long-term roadmap for building New Jersey's clean energy and green industries into powerful engines for job creation, economic growth, and equitable investments. Electrifying fleets of buses, vehicles, and port equipment will be an essential part of this mission. And I am thrilled to share that I have seen truly widespread enthusiasm for this new and exciting industry. Just this past weekend, um, I learned of an incredibly motivated and compelling grassroots movement to electrify an entire city in New Jersey. And I have spoken with countless innovators and people already working within the field, including those at uh, Tesla. Um, in, in South Jersey, I know of at least one individual who is working to build an electric vehicle plant intended to electrify jitneys servicing the Jersey Shore. Um, and I just think this is you know, such an incredible way to protect one of our state's most prized natural resources. Uh, and the scope of Governor Murphy's energy master plan and his overall climate action investment strategy extend far beyond uh, electrification of vehicles. In fact, just last month, also in South Jersey, we broke ground on the New Jersey wind port, a literally once in a generation project that will create hundreds of jobs and attract billions of investment dollars to uh, our great state. This transformative project is proof that climate action can drive investments in infrastructure and manufacturing, creating good paying union jobs and help us reach our goal of 100% clean energy by the year 2050. Moreover, our effort to lead the nation in the green economy is also an essential opportunity to do good and to do well by our inner city communities. The mission of the Council on the Green Economy is to achieve our administration's climate goals with a constant and unyielding focus on achieving equity. And that is true for both job and wealth creation, as well as protecting the health of our underserved environmental justice communities who truly have suffered disproportionately from the health and safety consequences of the climate crisis. As we move forward, uh, I am proud to share that each and every member of the council is deeply and personally committed to this work. We have very robust conversations. Uh, and of course, I must also share how proud I am that while we work to grow New Jersey's green economy, we are also preparing our students for the jobs of the future. Beginning in the 2022-23 school year, our New Jersey students will be the first and only in the nation to have climate change education incorporated across all K-12 learning standards. This means that when they graduate, they will be the leaders of this new economy equipped to face the real life challenges of climate change, no matter what career they choose. These, these opportunities for change have given us great cause to be hopeful and incredibly optimistic for New Jersey's future. But at the same time, we cannot lose sight of what is at stake. Um, for many New Jersey residents, 
last month drove home the urgency of the climate crisis. Many lost property, some lost loved ones. And as the cleanup in many of our communities still continues, I am heartened to see the way that friends and neighbors have come together to support one another and rebuild. Um, it, it is this same spirit of community and service that drives the mission and values of this administration and the work of the Council on the Green Economy. And in this, we are so grateful to have so many trusted partners around the state because this truly is an all hands on deck effort and moment. Uh, we intend to make a profound and transformational change in order to protect our environment and our future. And together with the World Resources Institute and many organizations, coalitions and grassroots movements across the state, we will do so in a way that is equitable and that lifts every New Jersey resident. Thank you so much for having me, Justin. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate your uh, commitment and the administration's commitment and uh, your setting the stage for our uh, deep dive into school buses with uh, some great uh, overviews of the climate landscape, the climate goals of the administration and where all this fits in. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're so uh, grateful to have you. Absolutely. And, uh, and you have my you have my good friend coming up next. So uh, hats off to the uh, congressman. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. So again, thank you to our uh, New Jersey's First Lady, Tammy Murphy, for kicking us off this morning. We are grateful to have another great uh, champion for uh, school bus electrification and climate action, uh, equitable climate action broadly in uh, Congressman Frank Pallone, and he is uh, up next as our next speaker. So um, Congressman Pallone, I think no stranger to many folks on this call, uh, but uh, he was sworn in for his full, his 17th full term in the U.S. House of Representatives on January 3rd of this year. He represents the 6th Congressional District in New Jersey, which includes most of Middlesex County, as well as uh, Bayshore and uh, oceanfront areas of Monmouth County. And he's now chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which has one of the broadest jurisdictions of any congressional committee. I think uh, it's worth noting just how important the congressman's uh, leadership of energy and commerce is for transportation electrification broadly and for school bus electrification specifically um, the committee's jurisdiction includes issues pertaining to healthcare, energy, environment, commerce, food and drug safety. Um, the congressman has had a seat on the committee since 1993 and been involved in historic efforts uh, to phase down hydrofluorocarbons and methane leak repairs. And he's also advanced uh, the fight against climate change with a plan to achieve a 100% uh, clean economy by 2050. I overall, um, on behalf of World Resources Institute and Electrification Coalition and others on this call, just want to thank him for his uh, championing of the electric school bus issue specifically. I think there's the potential to, uh, which he'll speak to in a minute, to get a significant amount of federal investment uh, towards making progress on this issue. And we wouldn't be where we were today, where we are today, uh, poised to, for significant action on the electric school bus issue without his leadership and overall commitment to issues of health equity and climate uh, justice. So we're grateful for him uh, joining us this morning and I will turn it over to the Congressman. Thank you, Justin. And um, let me uh, thank you particularly for that uh, really nice introduction. I, I often say politically that after an introduction like that, why would I say anything? Cause it's all gonna be downhill after that, but thank you. I'm actually in, um, Atlantic City today. That's why the curtain, I should open the curtain, but then you can't really see me too well because then you can see the beautiful uh, Atlantic Ocean off Atlantic City. I'm down here for the building trades uh, conference. So I'm going to speak to them after, after I speak to you. But I only mention that in part because obviously uh, representing a district along the ocean in the central part of the state uh, and, and, and knowing how important it is, you know, issues uh, such as sea level rise, resiliency, all the things that relate to climate change are, are particularly important to our state. And, and I really wanted to start by, I, I was able to listen to First Lady uh, Tammy Murphy and what she just said, Justin, and I just wanted to thank her for all she does. I mean, the biggest thing 
that I think she does is to is to draw attention to the need for climate action through education. And so, you know, having the climate change in our states curriculum for K to 12 is so important because that's the future and it's the young people and the kids that are going to be the future are going to have to live with all these changes hopefully uh, for the better if we if we take some action and of course the governor has always been uh out front on environmental issues i remember when he was first uh, sworn in and he put us back into reggie which was the regional greenhouse gas initiative that the previous governor christie had taken us out of tammy mentioned the uh, new jersey wind port and all he's done to move towards wind power, which has been most significant. And I have to say, I mean, a lot of times people focus on the federal government and say, well, everything comes from Washington, but that's not really true. Actually, most things come from the states. And even when we pass programs, which I'm gonna talk about now for a few minutes, uh, if you don't have a state government, both a state, a governor like Phil Murphy or a legislature that are willing to carry these federal initiatives out, then they don't get done. And so most of what we're trying to do at the federal level would complement states uh, if they've already made a lot of progress on addressing climate action like New Jersey uh, to help them out even more or to try to push those states that haven't so that they actually do it. Um, I, I'm going to be going to the Glasgow conference um, in November. Um, and that, of course, is going to be the latest under the Paris Agreement to try to achieve the goal that Tammy said of 100% clean energy by, by 2050. Uh, and we're hoping that over the next few weeks, we're able to pass this package of bills so that when we go to Glasgow, we can say, hey, look, this is what the United States is doing to achieve the climate goals that have been set out under the, under the Paris Agreement and followed through on Glasgow. But just to, you know, again, highlight how, how dire things are, the, that UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, report, this year's report, uh, found that we have less than a decade to slash our carbon pollution in half, otherwise global warming will sail past the two, two degrees Celsius benchmark that was set under the Paris Agreement. So there's really no time to waste. And that's why you know, I wanna thank you, Justin, the World Resources Institute, the Electrification Coalition that are putting this event together. Now, in the context of, of what we're doing on climate action, obviously electric school buses and clean energy transportation in general are key to the goal. We'll never achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement uh, if we don't um, electrify our transportation sector. And, um, and, and, and Tammy also pointed out that by doing that, you create a lot of great jobs. Uh, prior to COVID, a statistic showed that nearly 3.3 million Americans worked in clean energy, outnumbering fossil fuel jobs by, by three to one, just to show the magnitude of it. And medium hourly wages for clean energy jobs are 25% higher than national medium wage. Maybe Justin, I'm thinking about that I have to go speak to the building trade soon. So that's why I'm giving you those statistics. You probably don't need them. But in any case, um, we have two bills that you've heard a lot about uh, that we're working on in Congress. And I just call them a package as they really are. One is the Senate-based ba Senate bipartisan infrastructure agreement. Uh, it's called the BIF. We always have these acronyms. And the other one is the uh, Build Back Better Act, which is the reconciliation bill, the one that essentially originates in the House um, th that, um, you know, that we're still working on. Uh, both of these, in my opinion, are, are going to move together. In other words, it's pretty obvious from what's been happening in Congress in the last two weeks that you're not going to be able to pass one without the other, because the House and the Senate want to, you know, both have their bills, uh, various Democratic um leaders have their bill you know have their initiatives and we're going to have to do them all together essentially um and uh, as you know and i'm trying not to be uh, terribly partisan for the most part a lot of the republicans are not very supportive of these things so that's why it takes time because we have narrow majorities only 50 50 in the senate and so to do all this together we um uh, you know, we have to have almost every Democrat on board, and that's what we're working on. But let me just talk about these two bills, and then I'll, then I'll leave you alone. Um, so the bipartisan, uh, or I should say the Senate infrastructure bill, basically invests $5 billion in school buses, with half of that exclusively for zero emission school buses. And I think that um, those investments will not only make it possible to have more electric school buses, but also drive demand for American-made batteries, uh, create jobs and supporting domestic manufacturing, and also remove diesel buses from 
uh, a lot of these communities where they're using diesel. So it's not only that we're moving towards electrification, but also we're moving pollution from diesel. Um, and we estimate, you know, thousands of electric school buses uh, would be uh, built and used nationwide. Um, and but but that's it. That's in the um, in the uh, Senate bill in the infrastructure bill. The, the Build Back Better Act, which is the House bill, the one you hear a lot about, um, some people call it the Reconciliation Act, it goes even further and builds upon that Senate infrastructure bill. And it makes, um, uh, I mean, just to give you a list, it has $5 billion for replacing heavy duty vehicles such as school buses and refuge trucks with zero emission vehicles through a grant program at the EPA. It has 13.5 billion in electric vehicle infrastructure because obviously having the buses is not good enough and, and any uh, electric vehicles unless you have the charging station. So we have to develop that in, in New Jersey and around the country. And then 7 billion in multiple loan and grant programs at Department of Energy for development of new technologies and American manufacturing of zero emission transportation technology. So what I, I guess I'm trying to, to sort of sum up um, what we're doing, we're trying to get money back to states and communities so they can buy the buses. We want the buses built here. We want research and money for new technology. And we also want to have the charging stations um, available um, you know, around the state or around the country, be it whatever it may be. So. Um, uh, but I mean, of course, I'm only talking about the school buses, but, you know, the Build Back Better Act uh, has all kinds of investments in, uh, in, uh, in a clean economy, like Tammy mentioned, with, uh, you know, building a clean energy grid, uh, having a, a clean electricity performance program so that utilities have to move towards renewables and away from fossil fuels. It has a greenhouse gas reduction fund, which is like the green bank, if you will. And it's basically trying to create this green economy that Tammy mentioned uh, for the 21st century. And, um, you know, all I can say is that, you know, what, what is this is all about? This is all about the future of the country, the future of the planet. Um, I try to, Justin, I try to stay away from talking too macro, if that's the word. You know, Pete, when you mention Glasgow, you know, people's eyes blur over. Even when you talk about national issues, a lot of people's eyes blur over because they say, I only care about what's happening locally. But what I really want to stress, and this goes back to Tammy again, is that whatever we do nationally is only going to complement the states and the towns. It's still going to be primarily their effort uh, to get this done and the federal government, uh, you know, backing it up with the funding and the and the sort of carrot and stick approach, if you will, uh, to make it happen, because not every state is like New Jersey and like Governor Murphy and, and, and Tammy Murphy. And of course, when you talk about uh, climate, as when you talk about healthcare, it doesn't do any good if you only protect yourself or your own community, your own state, because what's happening is global, right? So we've got to think of this in a global sense, as much as a lot of people don't like to think that way. So I'll leave it at that. And thank you for all that you do. Uh, not only you, Justin, but the coalition and the uh, World Resources Institute. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Congressman, for joining us. We're uh, grateful for your perspective and leadership and appreciate your continued advocacy for dedicated, dedicated electric school bus funding and uh, appreciate your points also about how the federal money is a, a, an essential part of this, but just the first step. And that's why we're here today to talk about uh, the, what New Jersey is already doing and what it can do going forward uh, to really advance school bus electrification in an equitable way. So thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule and have fun in Atlantic City. And uh, thanks for being with us this morning. Thanks, Justin. Thank you so much. And we are going to go right into our uh, next speaker. Uh, thrilled to introduce Melissa Miles, uh, the current executive director of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Uh, she's been a grassroots activist and uh, organizer on these issues for years and uh, serves on a bunch of steering committees right now for uh, uh, the New Jersey DEP and the Coalition for Healthy Ports and uh, nationally is on uh, the Moving Forward Networks Advisory Board. And as well, um, Melissa recently joined WRI's National Advisory Council on our for our electric school bus initiative and thrilled to have her uh, talk this morning about uh, the environmental justice 
implications and health equity implications for school bus electrification. So uh, without further ado, we'll turn it over to Melissa. Thank you so much, Justin. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be with you all here today. And uh, so difficult to follow um, First Lady Murphy and Congressman Pallone, um, but I will do my best. Um, and it's interesting because uh, in Congre Congressman Pallone's final words, you know, he mentioned um, that it doesn't do much good, you know, to think about things just in terms of like how we can benefit ourselves or our own individual um, families or communities because, you know, these issues are, are widespread. And it's interesting because I've just been thinking about how, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, we heard a lot about these NIMBY movements, right? Um, a lot of folks' uh, issues and, um, you know, view of environmental issues was kind of really limited to their own communities and keeping certain um, polluting facilities out of their communities. But, you know, what I realized was that one of the major contributions of the environmental justice movement and the um, equity uh, conversation has been to adjust our lens um, beyond the impacts on, you know, our, our towns or our um, cities and really help us to um, think about the environment and, um, you know, the, the, the impacts in a way that is much more humanistic, humanistic in its good sense, not humanistic and just centering humans, because as we know, um, you know, this is an, an issue that is impacting the entire planet and everything on it. But, um, you know, we have brought, I think, a much more inclusive lens to this conversation. So, you know, when we think about, um, you know, issues of equity, I myself think about it in terms of like the fourth box, you know, how we can create an environment that is, um, you know, one of unhindered inclusion of uh, communities, um, you know, without, without those that are most impacted, without, you know, any type of barriers to their participation in decision making. And, you know, we definitely balance the speed of what has to happen with the nuance that is involved, right? So we, we bring lots of nuance to the conversation. So for example, um, you know, my organization, New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, we do a lot of work around zero emissions, right? So electrification, um, not my area of expertise, admittedly, but we do talk a lot about zero emissions, particularly when it comes to heavy duty vehicles. Um, we've done a lot around ports and trucks, um, and I'm really excited to be foraying into uh, electric school buses as well. Um, you know, like many of you, we do not support transition fuels. That's one of the things we don't have time for, you know, to kind of figure and bumble our way there. We know that changes need to be made very quickly and they need to be very drastic. Um, we also, uh, you know, spend a lot of time talking about reduction and, emit, uh, and elimination of emissions from the energy sector. This is one of the nuances that we bring to the, to the table, right, because we understand that we can't displace um, emissions from the transportation sector onto the energy sector. So we also do a lot of work to make sure that the energy sector um, will be able to, to keep pace, right? We don't wanna see the same communities that are most um, impacted by diesel emissions then being impacted by emissions from the um, energy infrastructure that they also house. Um, and that potential unfortunately is there. Um, so we have been for over a decade championing the cause of mandatory emissions reductions in climate policy um, in New Jersey, well over a decade for exactly that reason. Um, you know, there's always the, the chance that we miss um, really uh, helping those that are most impacted in climate change policy. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that may look like at times. So one of the other recent initiatives that I'm sure you all have been following is New Jersey's groundbreaking cumulative impact law that was passed last year, um, which speaks to the overall disparate burden in communities of color and low income communities in New Jersey. And, you know, 
one of the things that we've really been able to highlight is that when we um, when we prioritize change in the most vulnerable communities, when they see improvement and benefits, everyone benefits. But unfortunately, it doesn't always work the other way around, um, which is why it's so important to have folks from environmental justice communities with that lens always at the table and always in the conversation. It is, in fact, possible to adopt measures that benefit the greater good, but end up hurting EJ or overburdened communities. So for example, policies and processes that don't include those communities and their meaningful input from the very start in large enough numbers to adequately represent you know, their diverse communities. Um, that's one way that EJ and overburdened communities can be harmed in processes that are designed to um, benefit all. Another way is when we prioritize financial gains. Now we all know that you know, it will take resource to, to fund these initiatives, but when we prioritize resource over direct emissions reductions, um, there is always that chance that we won't get the emissions reductions that we actually need. Um, and, and then you know, the money almost becomes a moot point. Another way that we can potentially harm EJ and overburdened communities is when we use questionable measures, um, which for us look like offsets, carbon markets, taxes, trades, investments. And I know, you know many sectors um, and many um, parts of the environmental community are very much in favor of carbon taxes and trades and, and, and these sorts of measures. But what we found is that um, you know, studies have shown that they don't necessarily decrease emissions in the communities that are most vulnerable. And so you know, we don't want to rely on maybes. You know, we know that we need policies and laws that first protect those communities. And then we talk about um, you know, finance and how we finance um, you know, new initiatives. Um, and that is the perspective that we take. Now, understandably, there is a range within the environmental movement, but I feel that we're all on the same side and we have to be willing to bring those uh, voices to the table. We can't ignore them simply because, you know, they're saying something different than, you know, what, what we'd want to hear. Um, you know, another way that we can really ensure that we have that, that full lens is to take the lead from those that are closest to the issue. So in, in the uh, environmental justice and Jemez principles, we talk about ground up organizing. So we sort of flip the view of expertise, right? So those that may have the resource and the technical expertise really come to the table to listen to those who have the lived experience. Only then can we really develop solutions that work in those communities. It, it can't happen the other way around. We can't create solutions and then deliver them because unfortunately, you know, there have been you know, many instances where those solutions have not been widely accepted. And um, you know, we, we need to be able to actually bring folks that are impacted in early on in large enough numbers and in a way that is, is meaningfully inclusive. So, you know, this is a really exciting way to begin uh, such an initiative. And, you know, as we begin, I, I really want us to ask ourselves who is missing from the conversation? Because unfortunately, those that most need to be here may also be the hardest to engage. Uh, so we can't, we can't be satisfied with just going for the low hanging fruit. And, you know, honestly, the low hanging fruit, we're the low hanging fruit. We are the first, we are the bottom believers, right? Many of us are also paid to do this work, which means that we can be here on, uh, you know, during the morning um, and here engaging in this amazing conversation. Um, you know, the low hanging fruit are those that, you know, it will take work and relationship building to bring to the table, but those are the folks we need the most. Um, so I would like to thank you very much for giving me um, some time to make some brief remarks on why it is so important 
that we have an EJ and equity lens throughout this process. This is just the beginning, um, but I, I hope that we can um, you know, continue to make this one of our top priorities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa, for your leadership and uh, determined advocacy and for uh, helping us keep equity front and center uh, as we move along here and for giving us your time this morning and your input on our advisory council. So appreciate your continued leadership and involvement. I think now we're going to take just a couple of minutes to stretch our legs. Uh, we're going to ask folks to be back at on their screen at 10.05. Uh, thank you so much uh, for for joining us again this morning. Uh, what a what a kickoff. Uh, so uh, really, really wonderful slate of, of perspectives already shared with us. Uh, and moving on to our next, uh, I think, bright lights in the agenda. Very excited uh, to turn over uh, the conference to uh, what I like to call Team Reggie. Uh, so we have got a fantastic lineup of representatives from state agencies that are wrestling with ESB deployment and, uh, and multiple efforts to jumpstart this green economy and transition uh, to uh, EVs across sectors. But they're gonna be sharing with us specifically what they're doing around ESBs and what they expect to do around ESBs. Uh, so I'm gonna hand the whole panel over to uh, to Hannah Thone, who is uh, very excited to have with us. She is the climate and energy strategist uh, charting New Jersey's path to 100% clean energy. She's the chief architect of New Jersey's 2019 energy master plan, and she's the senior policy advisor in the state's regulatory and energy office. So uh, really in very good hands uh, to move us through uh, this time together with these state uh, regulatory agencies. Uh, so Hannah, are you there? I am here and, and also, hi, uh, good morning, Aaron. Also recognizing I should have sent you an updated uh, bio. I'm in the governor's office now, but I was formerly in the regulatory office. Um, I think this is a re really great opportunity for us. Um, so as Aaron mentioned, I am the Governor Murphy's Policy Advisor for Energy and the Environment. And with me today for this panel are three of our leaders on vehicle electrification in New Jersey. We have Peg Hanna from DEP, uh, Pallavi Madhukasira from EDA, and Christine Sadovi from uh, BPU, our Board of Public Utilities. Governor Murphy has made climate action a cornerstone of his agenda. He was the first to campaign on 100% clean energy. And as the First Lady mentioned earlier, the administration has been moving forward on several fronts over the past four years to reduce climate emissions, to improve our air quality, and to grow the green economy. And chief among our climate priorities has been vehicle electrification with a particular focus on medium and heavy duty vehicles because electrifying these vehicles can have an outsized impact on environmental justice outcomes and economic benefits. When New Jersey rejoined REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, we dedicated the first three years of annual REGI funds to transportation decarbonization. Um, and uh, in our first year alone of REGI, we allocated $100 million in combined REGI and Volkswagen funds specifically to medium and heavy duty vehicle electrification programs. So our three panelists are going to present on how New Jersey is supporting vehicle electrification and school bus electrification in particular. And then we'll move into some Q&A and we can take some questions from the audience. So with that, um, uh, thank you again for joining us. We're really excited to be here and talk about you know, what we're doing and how important this is to New Jersey. And I'm going to kick it over to Peg Hanna to get us started. Okay. Morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I've been with DEP for 30 years now, which is my whole career, if you want to do that math, and excited for the last five years or so to be working on transportation electrification in collaboration with EDA and BPU and uh, many of our other sister agencies. I wanted to start off by giving you a little bit of the why. So my kids are 23 and 20. And when they were growing up and I would tell them to clean their room or you know clear their place, they would say, why, 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 why do we have to do that? So I really think it's important for this conversation before we jump into what we need to do to talk a little bit about why we need to do it. Um, let me just screen share real quick, sorry. Didn't realize that my slides were not. Um, 
Sorry, bear with me for one second. Peg, in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little projector screen. You can- There we go. There you go. Can you see that now? Is that good? Okay. Um, so let's talk about the why for a second. Uh, about two months ago now, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released their sixth assessment on climate change. And it contained, in my opinion, a lot of really startling conclusions. The one that stood out for me is the one that's highlighted here, which says it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years. That's a big number. Um, during the press release, the United Nations chief called it code red for humanity. They also said in their assessment that the projected changes in extremes are larger in, in frequency and intensity with every additional increment of global warming. So I think for sure, this is a call to action. So in addition to thinking about climate change, the pollutants that we have traditionally focused on still remain very important. We know that the largest source of particulate matter and NOx, which forms ozone in the presence of sunlight, is coming from the transportation sector. So there's another why. The other thing that was interesting to me when I started focusing and learning about climate change is that climate change not only has environmental impacts, which is what we tend to see in the headlines about rising sea levels and more extreme weather, uh, icebergs are melting, glaciers are moving, but it also results in some pretty serious and wide ranging health impacts. And that's what this slide from the Centers for Disease Control illustrates here. So why are we focusing on transportation particularly as a cause of climate change and um, traditional criteria pollutants. When we do our emissions inventory for New Jersey, and this one is for 2018, you can see here that transportation is the biggest source of climate pollutants in New Jersey. So if we're going to get to our ambitious 2050 climate change goals, we need to necessarily be focusing on the transportation sector. There was a slide during the coffee break, if any of you um, had a chance to see it, that had a whole bunch of different uh, statistics listed. And I also heard Melissa Miles say, we need to make sure that everyone else, that everyone is at the table, that the right people are at the table, and we need to think about who's missing. And the, to me, that's the, the takeaway that I wanted you to get from this slide here that this is not a government only endeavor. Converting to electric school buses and electric vehicles is not something that New Jersey government agencies are going to do solo. We really need um, a combination of stakeholders and a combination of approaches if we're going to get there. And that's exactly why we're all spending time with you here today and why um, we put together this workshop in conjunction with WRI. We are asking for your help, your feedback, your participation, your support, your collaboration, um, and your ideas. So with that as the context uh, setting, a little bit of framing, let's talk about um, for a minute some things that have transpired over the last couple of years that are hopefully going to move us towards our goal. So, Throughout this presentation, and I'm sure with my colleagues at EDA and BPU, you're gonna hear us talk about medium and heavy duty vehicles. And for those of you that aren't accustomed to that, those terms, that basically means anything more than 8,500 pounds. So anything other than a car or truck, typically car or pickup truck um, is typically more than 8,500 pounds. And that's what we call medium and heavy duty. So our goals are to electrify medium and heavy duty vehicles. There was a law passed that Governor Murphy signed in 2019, which required DEP to establish goals for medium and heavy duty vehicle electrification and associated charging infrastructure. We are in the process of developing those goals. There's some additional things here that the law required, but we're not gonna touch on those today because those are really for the lighter duty vehicles. Those are for the um, cars and pickup trucks operating throughout the state. We have about 500,000 medium and heavy duty vehicles in the state today. 
About a year ago, the governor signed this MOU, which set a benchmark for us. So this MOU that we executed with 15 other states and jurisdictions, including California, said that by 2030, 30% of our medium and heavy duty trucks and buses will be electric. And by 2050, it will be 100%. The memorandum of understanding also required us to focus on low income communities and accelerate deployment in those communities. We already did a lot of stakeholder engagement with auto manufacturers, utilities, NGOs, et cetera. That process is continuing and we are actually putting pen to paper now on the development of an action plan. That action plan will help inform the goals that DEP is required to set. Um, I also wanted to mention that when we did this MOU and we established those goals, it was based on a market analysis, which showed that there are about 70 models of medium and heavy duty trucks commercially available right now in a variety of weight classes and applications. And that number is expected to increase to 150 models just in the next two years alone. So by 2023, the projections also show that we are expected to reach Parity, cost parity, so total cost of ownership parity by 2025. So that just signifies the level of engagement and resources that are being dedicated to electrifying this sector. So as I said, we have about 500,000 uh, medium and heavy duty trucks and buses on the road today. The exact numbers and you know, units on the X and Y axis here are not as important as just the slope of this trajectory. The last count in 2020, uh, December 2020, we had a handful of electric trucks and buses on the road. I wanna say maybe uh, 10 or 15. In order to get to the 2030 and the 2050 goals that I mentioned that are in that memorandum of understanding, you can see how steep the trajectory is. So by 2030, depending on um, which assumptions you are putting into this, we're looking at 50,000. And then by 2050, we need almost 400,000 out of the 500,000 to be electric. So again, very steep trajectory, very long way to go. So the collaboration through the memorandum of understanding and the EV law obviously are, are two pieces of this. We're also working on a regulation called the Advanced Clean Truck Rule. It was formally proposed a couple months ago the comment period has closed and we are working on the adoption document. This rule is modeled after California's rule and it would require that the auto manufacturers sell an increasingly larger number of electric trucks and buses in New Jersey, starting in mile year 2025 and going up to 2035 where you can see the sales totals would be between 40 and 75% depending on the weight of the vehicle. We are also very closely monitoring a companion rule that California is working on called the Advanced Clean Fleet Rule. That rule would impose requirements on fleet owners to actually purchase these electric trucks and buses that, are, that the manufacturers are being required to sell. So another strategy that we've really been focused on is providing incentives and grants. Over the past couple of years, we have awarded, uh, I think it's over $100 million now to electrify trucks and buses in environmental justice areas. I was uh, particularly pleased to be at the ribbon cutting and the press event for um, yard tractors that were deployed at our port. So there were 10 zero emission battery electric yard trucks that were deployed at Red Hook Terminal in Port Newark. I'm told this is the largest deployment of its kind in the Eastern US. So again, New Jersey trying to lead the way here. We also awarded money for electric school buses in Elizabeth, which are pictured here. We hope to announce um, approximately, I think it's $20 million more of awards for electric trucks and school buses in the coming weeks based on our last project solicitation. And then one thing that we don't often think about, but which is really important, is the permitting requirements for putting charging stations in. 
So earlier this year, Governor Murphy signed a law which uh, I think is unprecedented. It requires that, um, uh, it requires, sorry, it requires the streamlining of the permitting process for charging stations throughout the state. What's unique about it is that this requirement takes effect to be a model ordinance immediately upon publication in every single municipality. That's never been done before, to my knowledge. And that really signifies the importance of all state agencies looking at every single aspect of this and figuring out how we get to the finish line together. For reference, we have a website which contains a tremendous amount of information. About two weeks ago, we expanded this website to include a dedicated site for medium and heavy duty truck electrification. So I welcome you to take a look at that. There are a lot of resources on there, including upcoming announcements of um, grants, policy decisions, guidance, et cetera. Also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We have a very, very active social media presence. And thank you. Peg, thank you so much for that. Um, Pallavi, are you ready? Uh, yes, I am. I'm just gonna try to share my screen. Hopefully it works. Do you see the split screen or do you see? Uh, you see the split screen. Okay. Go to display settings at the top. There. At the top, there's three buttons. It says taskbar, display settings, and end slideshow. Click on display settings. For some reason, it won't show me that. Page. There you go. That didn't just work. next to where you just clicked display settings. I don't think I'm seeing what you're seeing. Uh, where you just were, click back on that ellipses dot, and then there was a button that said hide presenter view. Click on that. All right. Did that work? Uh, no, it did not. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm going to try that again. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. And do you see full screen or still split screen? Uh, we, we see it in the editing mode. If you click on uh, the small icon, bottom right hand uh, corner of the screen, you should be able to move into presenter. Yep, slideshow. Yeah, I've already clicked it for some reason. It won't. On the upper bar, it says slideshow. Uh, very top bar, fourth button from the right, it says slideshow. Very top of your screen. Yeah. I'm sorry about this. Pallavi, scroll your cursor to the very top where it says home. Yep. And then scroll over, keep going, keep going. I see, the, okay, there you go. There's a button that says slideshow, click on that, and then yep. scroll over to the left, click from beginning, very good. Yeah, unfortunately, it's only showing it on the separate screen. Mm. Pallavi, do you want to just email me the presentation and I can work on presenting it and in the meantime you can start talking through it? Yeah, uh, or I have a better idea. Give me one second. No. Do you see it? I think that fixed it. I'm, there we go. You got it. <laughs> all right, take it away. I'm sorry about that. No I worries, no worries. We're all good. Like all right, I don't know how to get rid of this bottom bar here, but I'm just going to go with it. Uh, 
so first of all, thank you. And thanks for having patience before I, while I figure this out. Um, when I was asked to participate on this round table about electric school buses, um, school buses in general bring back fond memories for me. When I was a child um, going to school in Southern India, our school bus was blue. And I had the luxury of walking to school, but most of my best friends and classmates uh, actually used to live very far away, about an hour away. And some of them, some, some of whose parents were uh, agricultural farmers, others who used to work in industries in a different part of town entirely. And some of whose parents were professors at this little university campus on the way to school. And the thing that really connected all of us um, was essentially this blue school bus. And it sort of became uh, representative of this melting pot of ideas, uh, a diverse set of audience. And it really connected communities in ways and it brought us all together in ways that we could never have imagined before. Um, and I think that largely stays uh, true even to this day in that school buses play a very important and a critical role in connecting communities um, from one community with another, but also providing a critical mode of transport where there isn't any other that's available. Okay. New Jersey's goals, as you heard already, Peg um, explain and also Hannah uh, go ahead before me. Uh, Governor Murphy's goals for New Jersey to transition to, toward this decarbonized economy are ambitious. Uh, we need to reduce our emissions by 80% uh, by 2050, and we need to electrify the transportation sector. And you heard Peg earlier mention uh, about the targets that we have in converting medium heavy duty vehicles by 2030, which is sort of an interim goal, and then 100% of that by 2050. In doing all this, obviously, uh, Governor Murphy's vision for the state is about creating a stronger and fairer economy that truly works for all. And that means uh, not just putting more vehicles on the street, but essentially ensuring that that translates into tangible opportunities for historically overlooked communities um, as well as, um, you know, ensuring that there is a thriving innovation economy, because you sort of need all of them to, to, to work together. As you can see here, it's no surprise that transportation accounts for an overwhelming portion of the overall emissions in the state. So transportation accounted for 42%, and off of which um, medium and heavy duty vehicles account for over half of the 42%, so roughly 23% of the emissions um, are from medium and heavy duty vehicles. What this tells you obviously is this, uh, this is an area that's ripe for investment and it's an opportunity. Uh, it, and anything that is ripe for investment means that there's going to be substantial opportunities in uh, enabling the right set of stakeholders to come to the table in promoting um, the kind of uh, workforce development programs to ensure that we are creating the workforce, uh, but also making sure that we're actually able to meet some of these targets that have been set out for the state. So obviously transitioning to this future that's, that looks more electrified than we are today um, means that we can obviously reduce the obvious targets right there uh, would be reducing emissions and emissions, especially in environmental justice communities. Um, but this also means that if we did, if we took the right set of approaches, worked in parallel in coordination with um, other state agencies, but also with the private sector and audience uh, and end users such as yourself, then we will be able to obviously create the right kind of jobs. Um, and obviously there's like a curve associated with some of these vehicles, right? We need to ultimately be able to reduce the cost of these vehicles to ensure that we can create an increasing economic opportunity. And therefore, what this means, again, is that there is a need for a cohesive statewide strategy that includes not just the government, but a whole set of stakeholders uh, that come to the table, that work together and collaborate with each other. Uh, we're sort of at this interesting um, uh, point in time where what I like to call is like the, the three-legged stool, if you will when you talk about broadly electrifying transportation and especially when it comes to like medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, there is a catch 22 in that we need, the, the, the first leg of it is essentially where we acknowledge that this transition to the electrified future won't happen at the flip of a switch. 
um, we understand that the cost of these vehicles is substantially higher than a comparable diesel or a gas vehicle. And therefore that automatically prevents uh, a wide swath of end users uh, from even having access or being able to access and purchase some of these vehicles. The flip side to that argument is unless there is more adoption of these vehicles, the cost of these vehicles themselves isn't going to come down. So the question is, how do we do that, right? So with the right set of tax incentives, grants, vouchers, and rebate programs, with the right set of financing programs, we can hopefully ensure that we are addressing concerns of both sides of this argument. Even if there were, let's say, a, and there is a, an audience for, that are takers that can afford some of these vehicles that are already much higher than a comparable gas or a diesel vehicle, we know that the reason they're not trying to do so or go through and pull the trigger in terms of, um, you know, or, or um, you know, pull the trigger in terms of actually purchasing these vehicles is largely due to their concern of the lack of uh, charging infrastructure. Um, when we talk about larger trucks that carry goods and services across state lines in particular, there's, a, uh, there's a, a high level of concern in the lack of a consistent and available infrastructure to charge these vehicles. So that in and of itself becomes a critical barrier that needs to be addressed. Um, again, the flip side to that argument is um, we need to know what kind of demand is coming online to ensure that in terms of grid planning and grid enabling capabilities, um, uh, institutions like the BPU can, can lay out a plan uh, for the future. And I think that's what we're doing right now. Uh, but it's, it's sort of a catch-22 there again in that we need charging infrastructure to enable more people to buy vehicles. But in order to have charging infrastructure, we need to know how many of these vehicles are sort of gonna come online. And the last piece here has to do with people. I mean, we can have as many trucks as we want. We can have all the charging infrastructure, but none of this is going to happen. None of this is going to be implemented unless we have the right set of stakeholders with the skills needed to install these charging stations. We need maintenance technicians. We need mechanics at garages who know how to handle and how to service some of these electrified versions of medium and heavy duty vehicles. And we ultimately need to ensure that if some of the costs of these vehicles need to come down, we are supporting an innovation economy that can enable a lower cost supply chain, right? We wanna make sure that the components that go into some of these vehicles can be made domestically, locally here in New Jersey so that we can factor in uh, or we can lower the costs and make sure that the, economy, the, the economics sort of work for all. So even if one of these legs of the stool don't work as efficiently, you can see that we're going to have sort of a, a, a rocky start and a rocky transition uh, toward this future, which is why um, state agencies such as the DEP, the BPU, the EDA, alongside our partner agencies of the DOT, as well as uh, private sector entities, we've been working together over the last um, many months um, to ensure that we come together to come up with a holistic plan and an approach, obviously, not everything can happen at the same time, but there are some incentives and there are some schemes in here that need to work in parallel to ensure that we lay the groundwork um, for the foreseeable future. From an EDA standpoint, one of the um, highlights, if you will, of um, our programs that we have taken, um, sort of kickstarted our approach to ensuring that this uh, industry gets uh, is, is we are spurring the right kinds of tools in the, in the industry, is our program called the New Jersey Zero Emission Incentive Program, or NJZIP uh, for short. It's a voucher program uh, focused primarily on medium duty vehicles. So we launched this earlier in April, uh, 2021, and we decided that this was going to be a pilot program and the pilot will initially focus on class 2B to class 6. So not the heavy duty vehicles, but anything that looks like, uh, you know, one of those trucks that delivers Amazon packages into to your front door up to, you know, a mini school bus. Uh, the reason is we wanted to make sure that we first test out how this program works, whether or not the program does what, it, what we intend for it to do, um, take our learnings and pivot and tweak as we move forward whether that be in terms of expanding the program or also coming up with new programmatic tactics that's, that create sort of the support infrastructure needed to ensure that a program like NJZIP is successful. 
So this voucher program is a first come first serve pilot program. Uh, we started off with a $15 million pilot with a $5 million set aside. And the vouchers itself range in value between $25,000 up to $100,000, depending on the vehicle. We started with an emphasis on two particular communities, um, Greater Newark and Greater Camden. For the EDA, no matter what program we uh, initiate or we kickstart, a, a large emphasis continues and will always be, and especially in the, in the scheme of uh, electrified transport, ensuring that we are targeting environmental justice communities. And that was one of the primary reasons that we focused on the Greater Newark and the Greater Camden area, which is essentially defined as a 10 mile radius outside of Newark and Camden. Uh, since April, we've had uh, over a dozen vendors that have been approved, vendors being companies that are either assembling these trucks uh, here in New Jersey or are actually manufacturing these trucks but selling them here in New Jersey um, to, to end users. And what we found is the program has been, um, I'm extremely thrilled that the program has been quite successful. We've had over 75% of the vouchers being given out to small businesses, which was one of the intended goals. So we now know that we need, we're doing something right. We want to make sure that we are able to scale this program up as we think about what the future holds for something like an NJSEP. Um, what we've also done is with the set aside, we now know that the set aside has been taken accounted for fully across uh, Greater Camden and Greater Newark. We started with a $15 million um, pilot and about two and a half weeks ago, we actually announced the expansion of this pilot by almost another close to 9.25 to be precise. So about $10 million um, to top it off to like 25 million. And the third community that was chosen is the Greater New Brunswick area. Again, the 10 mile radius of Greater New Brunswick. As you can see, uh, the, the goal here is to not just put vehicles on the market, but the goal here is to ensure that we are creating the right set of uh, frameworks for uh, the future launch and the future scaling of medium and heavy duty vehicles here in New Jersey. Um, the hope is that as, we, as, as there's more demand uh, for programs like NJZIP, the manufacturers will take note. And I think we're already beginning to see that um, I think there was an article somewhere that said that New Jersey was called the California of the East. So I'm happy we will take that. Uh, is the goal, ultimately manufacturers are looking to see where, the, where there is greater demand. And I think the more demand that New Jersey can show for medium and heavy duty vehicles, we anticipate that manufacturers will seek to come here and set up manufacturing facilities here and also hire locally. And that's, a key piece of the overall puzzle here. We know that accelerating the adoption of these zero emission vehicles, as we are calling it, will ultimately create significant economic opportunity for the state. I know Peg earlier shared sort of this steep ramp of, of the number of vehicles that need to get on road in order for us to meet those targets that have been uh, set for New Jersey. Um, all I'm here to say is this, I think there's a range of possible options, right? Whether the, the, the state, the, the climb is a slow, uh, slow ramp, or if it's a straight line upwards. The ultimate goal here is um, we, we need to get to those targets and there is a range of possibilities. The EDA worked with a contractor and spent about the, uh, the better part of nine months starting from late 2020 into early part of 2021 um, to actually assess what this will mean in terms of the creation of jobs in this market. So. What we, what we found through this research was that if we did everything right, and if we had a policy-based uh, mechanism, a set of mechanisms that can spur this market, there would be an opportunity to create an additional 8,500 jobs by 2030. That's just in the next nine years. So as you can see in this little um, bar graph on the top right here, you will see that a large portion of those jobs will result primarily from charging station installations, because as more vehicles get on road, we need people to help install and to help maintain some of this infrastructure. That will eventually also spur jobs um, in aspects related to maintenance and repair, um, charge, uh, electricity sales, as well as uh, some reduction of existing jobs. So we're talking about gas stations that today pump just gas into vehicles, will likely have to start setting up infrastructure related to a electrified uh, charging station. And this is why um, investing 
in medium duty and sort of transitioning from a gas or a diesel base towards a zero emission future uh, is good for the economy. We know that uh, investing not just creates um, uh, sort of the economics, justifies the economics towards a reduced cost for the vehicle, but it can ultimately help generate GDP. The research that we did um, essentially resulted in showing that we could create as much as $3.1 billion in GDP alongside creating 8,500 jobs just in the next nine years. Um, so this is very important because ultimately GDP and the creation of jobs, we want to make sure that this is something that um, sort of is self-sustaining and can thrive even way past 2030 as we switch our tactics in terms of what sort of incentives or what sort of programs are here in place to support the growth of this economy. And this is where I think investing in innovation and ensuring that some of these manufacturers come here and set up um, their facilities here and hire locally will become exceedingly important. And this also means that this is, and, and investing in innovation is very much in line with Governor Murphy's uh, overall vision for the state of New Jersey. Um, in fact, in, investing in innovation will help reduce the cost of those material components that go into some of these vehicles. But it also means that if we did, we, if we invested in the right set of tools and think about economic development uh, through the lens of economic development, we can creatively problem solve for some of these uh, barriers. Um, in fact, recently, less than a month ago, uh, SOSV, which is one of the most successful venture capital firms in the world, uh, they have a series of accelerator programs across the world. One of their accelerator programs known as HACS, HACS is not an acronym, it's just called AJX, um, focuses primarily on decarbonization, supply chain um, innovation and industrial efficiency. So EDA and SOSV will be partnering to form a new entity called HACS LLC and SOSV has chosen Newark to set up the US headquarters. The idea here is that this sort of becomes a thriving hub of uh, and an ecosystem in and of itself, attracting anywhere between 20 to 25 companies in a given year that will be relocating either from different parts of the world or different parts of the US, but also ensuring that we are supporting and creating some of these companies here, right here in our backyards. Hacks will provide complete support for these emerging companies, including up to $250,000 in initial investment. And based on prior successes of SOSV through their HACS program, uh, we're eagerly looking forward to seeing how this uh, pans out and how this, how this transitions. Um, An investment such as this for the state of New Jersey is incredibly important because there are several other companies that are already here in New Jersey looking to attract the right set of investors. Um, EDA, in fact, partnered uh, with um, BPU. So we're extremely grateful for our partnership with BPU where we um, doled out these clean tech seed grant program, uh, seed grants for early stage companies that are looking to develop products that reduce or can demonstrate a reduction in emissions, NOx, SOx, and other particulate matter. We actually just announced the first 10 winners, each of who received up to $75,000 uh, for projects that they are keen on developing. So we hope that through some of these efforts where we are investing in innovation, making sure that we are also uh, providing the right set of in programs and um, a framework for creating the right set of jobs, such as the New Jersey Council on Green Economy, um, along with uh, internal programs like the NJ Zip, will sort of come together to create a future that will help us not only meet our ambitions and goals for the state, but will just create a better living and sort of health impacts uh, for the overall economy. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Christine. Thank you. Um, and thank you uh, the, to the coalition and to my colleagues. Um, you know, it's, it's really an exciting topic to be talking about today. Uh, I just have a few slides and I'm going to keep it uh, somewhat brief so that we can uh, have some questions if, if uh, Hannah would like. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the BPU's staff straw proposal on medium and heavy duty vehicle electrification. I'm going to just um, try to share my screen here for the few slides that I have and, and uh, get into 
the straw proposal. So, um, so as my colleagues have noted there, the transportation fuels account for over 40% of CO2 emissions in the state and medium and heavy duty vehicles make up a third of those emissions. Um, heavy duty vehicles are, are responsible for a disproportionate amount of particulate matter, uh, which, which, you know, as, as my colleagues at EDA and, and DEP have noted. Uh, and because of this, electrifying transportation is the number one strategy of the energy master plan. Um, and, you know, this chicken and egg scenario was something that I think has, through the partnership and, and each individual agency is kind of dealing with and, and probably something that we're dealing with around the country, right? Do, do we get the vehicles on the road first? Do we build the infrastructure first? And I think this administration under Governor Murphy's leadership is really t taking, you know, the two pronged approach and doing those things um, at, at the same time so that we can ensure that you know, we have the vehicles available, but that there is infrastructure to charge it. I, I'm not going to talk today about the light duty vehicle electrification that we're working on, but I, I do encourage folks to check out you know, all of the agencies and, and the good work that we're doing to get light duty vehicles on the road. So in order to achieve this, this key strategy of the EMP, board staff is continuing to work to build out equitable and reliable EV infrastructure. As I said, um, in 2020, we established minimum filing requirements for light duty vehicles. And right now what we're working on is the, min the minimum filing requirements for the medium and heavy duty ecosystem. Uh, the straw proposal really builds on the light duty filing requirements, which is you know, why I'm bringing that up because that is the baseline for how we are thinking about medium and heavy duty. Uh, in recognition that there are issues and challenges that we'll need to track to tackle while we build out medium and heavy duty infrastructure that you know maybe did not exist uh, in the light duty infrastructure build out or or as we're building it out. Uh, so we started staff started at the BPU with this modified share responsibility model, and I think that's the, really the key piece of the infrastructure is how the utilities and how private investment um, are you know married or intermingle or what their what their appropriate roles are. And so with the medium and heavy duty uh, infrastructure straw proposal, we have looked at a modified shared responsibility model that promotes appropriate roles for both the utilities and private in, uh, and private investment. So what you know what you ask is the shared responsibility model. Um, this was the basis for the light duty minimum filing requirements. Um, staff is proposing that utilities will be responsible for the wiring and the backbone infrastructure necessary for the build out of publicly accessible or public serving charging. And I think that's where we you know, are thinking about bus electrification, because while you know, school buses are not publicly accessible, um, certainly we can make the argument that, that school buses uh, are public serving. The utilities will do the work necessary for the make ready infrastructure for those vehicles that are accessible or that are served the public and socialize the costs associated for this work. Again, we would need to evaluate the planned infrastructure and conclude that for school buses, it, you know, it is public serving. And I think that's, you know, that's something that we're certainly looking at right now. And also not just school buses, but, but large fleets, um, how, while they may be private, are they serving the public or if they are not publicly accessible, how do they serve the public? And that's how you know that's how we have to determine what the socialization um, will look like in terms of costs. Another principle of the medium and heavy straw proposal is a commitment that all communities will have ex equitable access to electric charging infrastructure, um, and that could include incentives for medium and heavy duty vehicles like school buses and associated charging. And really our focus when we think about equ equitable access would be uh, particularly on overburdened communities. I'm just gonna go down to the next one. So there's a little bit more in here about the straw, but again, I'm just gonna talk, uh, talk a little bit more about what is in the straw proposal. Uh, many of you have probably attended stakeholder, one of the stakeholder meetings, so I won't get too far into the weeds. Um, one, again, one of the additional critical pieces is funding for planning and technical support. We're really in uncharted territory with what we're proposing in New Jersey. Few states have begun the process of electrifying heavy duty vehicles, certainly at scale. And you know, it's arguably no state as densely populated as, as New Jersey. Um, and that's really important because charging infrastructure, particularly with heavy duty vehicles, has 
some space consideration. So we are, we are I think, um, char charting a path here in New Jersey to be a leader on both um, light duty vehicle electrification, but also medium and heavy duty, particularly around infrastructure planning. We want to ensure that government agencies and public serving institutions like schools have the funding to support this. And in, again, to ensure equitable access, we um, the EDCs may provide up to 100% of the make ready charging infrastructure. Again, this is a straw proposal. So we are in the process of evaluating the comments. Um, but these are the things that the that staff is considering as you know possible policy um, possible policy direction for medium and heavy duty infrastructure. I'm just gonna hit on a couple more points um, and, and wrap it up as quickly as possible so we can get to questions. Under the shared responsibility model, performing upgrades on the utility side um, necessary to accommodate uh, the charging infrastructure and increase load will be part of the utility or EDC electric distribution company um, responsibility. And you know that, that is something that they are the technical, both the technical experts and also have the access to, you know, to the grid that, that makes that the responsibility of the EDC. Uh, wiring various locations upon request um, with priority sites given to, to serving publicly accessible fleets will also be a responsibility of the utility or EDC. Providing technical assistance to private and public fleets to ensure that planning, uh, infrastructure planning is being done appropriately. Um, the planning should address obviously timing, charging, incorporation of storage, and ensuring resiliency to, um, to address any interconnection issues that may arise. And then the final kind of key, key part of the utility or EDC um, infrastructure responsibility is developing hosting maps that identify where to prioritize make ready sites. Um, as well as identify locations where charging infrastructure can be located to meet, you know, meet our requirements, but also while avoiding lengthy and costly distribution upgrades. Um, so, you know, those are kind of the key pieces of the, the EDC or utility um, shared responsibility model, and that's really the basis of the medium and heavy duty charging infrastructure. So I'm going to stop there so that, you know, we have maybe a time for a couple of questions, but you know, if you want any additional information, uh, this is my contact information. You can visit one of our many social media um, or website links here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christine, and also Paula B and Peg for your earlier presentations. So um, we are gonna ask just like one or two questions. Um, love to really get your feedback on you know, we talked a lot about what the state is doing. What are some of the barriers that school fleet operators currently face uh, regarding adoption of electric school buses? And what is New Jersey doing to overcome them? How can we help? Um, I can start with that. I think the key barriers are financial, first and foremost. Um, and as we described, the state is providing millions of dollars in incentives. Um, both EDA and DEP have funding programs that include school buses. Um, so hopefully that helps with the upfront cost differential. Um, and then the, the total cost of ownership parity over time will hopefully improve the, the financial outlook as we move forward. And then I think the second piece of it is education. There's a learning curve for the, the drivers and the operators and the mechanics. And that's something that we probably um, still need to tackle. I think there's a lot of room for us to make some progress in that area, uh, particularly with a focus on workforce development and workforce training. Thanks guys. And I think um, we are actually at time. So we're going to wrap that up. Um, thank you so much for, um, for your participation. I think this is a really great conversation. Um, and I think we will be, uh, uh, we will work with the organizers here to share any resources necessary so that um, anyone interested in adopting electric school buses can get in touch with the various agencies um, and learn how we can be of assistance. Thank you so much again for, um, for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, Aaron, I guess I'll kick it back over to you. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation. I'm actually handing very quickly off so we can make up a little time to my friend Doug O'Malley with Environment New Jersey, who will introduce our next panel. Super. Thank you so much, Aaron. And thank you to 
all of uh, you know the speakers we just heard from um, from the Murphy administration. Uh, my name is Doug O'Malley. I'm the director of Environment New Jersey, and we're going to take a, a short virtual walk uh, down State Street uh, to the State House. And uh, I'm honored to be joined today by the powerhouse team uh, from the 18th Legislative District, uh, proving that Central Jersey is not only real but uh, very uh, you know very well represented. Uh, on electrification. And so we're going to have Senator uh, Dagnan, who represents um, not only 18th District, but also serves as chair of the Senate Transportation Committee. And then uh, Assemblyman Stanley, uh, who will also speak, who's new to, new to the legislature, um, but has already made a mark uh, on uh, electrification issues. Um, so really honored to have both of you here. And Senator, uh, let's start off with you. Hi, Doug. I always joke with Doug that every time I want to see him, I want his autograph because he's on TV all the time. But he is the embodiment of a respected, intelligent, focused advocate. Uh, but I'm going to have my running mate, Sterling, go first because I know he has a time constraint. And then I'll, I'll, I'll kick in after he goes. So, Sterling, on? Yes, Senator. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the uh, time that given to us from the Royal Resource Institute and the Electrification Coalition. Uh, thank you for you know having us on and talking about this. Uh, when I got into the assembly, this was one of the first bills that actually attracted me. Uh, this is something that uh, Senator Diagnan and Assemblyman Assemblywoman Pinkin were working on, and we really uh, worked hard with the governor's office and the BPU to make sure that this bill went through this uh, pilot program. Uh, one of the goals was to determine the operational reliability and cost effectiveness of replacing diesel powered school buses and also to provide low income communities a cost effective method uh, uh, and job opportunities to introduce this program to the community. Uh, this is also a very good uh, thing for the healthcare as, as far as for the children as well. So, when all these things were said and done, you know, it really uh, uh, being pro-environment, it really helped me. And I think that this, we really did a great job putting this through to the assembly. And once it passed through the assembly, you know, it went to the Senate and our great Senator here in the 18th district uh, put about some really good changes and we're going to, uh, which he's gonna be talking about uh, soon to provide it even better uh, cost-effective methods as well. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, thank everybody for all the, what they're doing in this, uh, uh, in this environment. You know, we really need to make sure that this gets off on the ground and electric school buses will be, the, it will be a step in the right direction to combat climate change and air pollution and to ensure the health of children and students. With more electric school buses on the road, local air pollution will improve and children won't be exposed to harmful diesel exhaust. A sustainable infrastructure is overall better for every part of our economy. With a greater demand for electric school buses, there will be more opportunity for jobs, manufacturing plants to open up within the state, and this will expand also our supply chain. So overall, you know, we want to build a better sustainable infrastructure that will reduce air and noise pollution in our communities. Uh, although this is just a pilot program, I feel you know, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in this area. And you know, I look forward to working with every single one of you who are in the coming sessions to make sure that this passes and we do the best we can. Thank you. Super, thank you so much, Assemblyman. And just as a, a reference, uh, you, the bill you uh, helped to champion, you were the prime sponsor of a pass with 57 votes at the end of June, A1971. So thank you for your, your leadership on that initiative. And now let me turn it over to uh, your uh, colleague, uh, Senator Dagnan. I noticed that Sterling has a little truck behind him there. You got to make that electric, Sterling. Yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Ford 19, I assume the 40. <laughs> you, took, you know, without getting off topic, which I have a tendency to do. My first car, I uh, think Jay, around town used to get eight miles to a gallon and on the highway, 12 miles to a gallon. It just showed, we wonder why we have environmental issues. and. And I, I, you know, I know that uh, Tammy Murphy was uh, one of the uh, keynote speakers here today. Let's give credit where credit is due. The governor's initiative to have 100% clean energy in New Jersey by 2050 is something that we not only should embrace, we have to embrace. We, we all know what just took place within the last few weeks with Hurricane Ida. 
I've never seen anything like it. And this is becoming more and more common. And, and if we don't understand it, there's climate change and shame on us. So, and I, and I wanna give, I, I don't wanna miss some names. So I actually wrote them down. Obviously, Doug has always been an absolute leader in this field and I can't tip my hat enough to him. But the Sierra Club, when it comes to this particular bill, just to give you the, the background, Nancy Penkin, who was Sterling's uh, uh, predecessor, really started this process with the uh, demonstration project for the schools. And uh, Sterling then when he was elected or, or uh, supported to replace Nancy, carried the ball immediately in the assembly and got it through the assembly in really lightning speed. So that was the starting point. Uh, we reached out to the environmental community, which really deserve all the credit and the Sierra Club, in particular environment, New Jersey and world resources. I just wanna mention the names, Kip Cherry, Bill Burren, uh, Gary uh, Frederick, Doug O'Malley, of course, as we just said, and Justin Valick were all absolutely essential in getting this done. I can take the credit, but the bill that we are about to drop is 100% the result of their hard work input in, in addition to my chief of staff, Greg Tafaro. And I also want to thank our running mate, Rob Karabinchik, who has been supportive of this from, from day one. And of course, uh, the speaker and the Senate president, who if I don't mention, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> and, and Dan Benson, who was just an incredible asset for uh, in, on the assembly side as the transportation chairman. Let me just tell you a little bit about the bill, Doug. I don't know if you've gone through it or not, but basically, the, the, the change is going to be to have the uh, uh, process over uh, looked or, or managed by the, uh, the uh, EDA, because that's where the money really is. And as they always say, that's the most important thing. And we're talking about now having a three-year pilot program, $15 million per year for a total of $45 million. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of money and it is, but in point of fact, we are confident that some of the federal funding will be available to offset this because this is an initiative, initiative, excuse me, that President Biden wants. As part of the process, everyone that was on this call is going to be part of the process, Board of Public Utilities, Department of Education, uh, DEP and motor vehicles will all be involved in what we're calling the electric school bus pilot program. So basically what it'll be $15 million per year, three year period, 45 million in total, there will be a total of six districts per year for a total of 18 districts. And one of those districts each year will be from a low income or what we refer to as a environmental justice community. Uh, New Jersey is a diverse state, you know, as, as, as we all know, uh, diverse not only in terms of population, but in terms of environment. Sussex County is totally different than Middlesex County. Uh, the bus routes are different. Uh, Essex County is different than Cape May County. So by doing this demonstration project, as everybody was talking about previously, we're going to know how long does the battery last? Is there a problem with maintenance? What's going to happen when the air conditioning is on in, this, in the summer? Is that going to affect it? So rather than guessing, uh, you know, where, do, where should we have the charging stations, as we've already talked about? So rather than guessing about it, this, this program will really put in place reliable information that we can use to, to move this forward. And again, I can't thank everybody enough for what they've done. I'm honored to be part of it. When the Senate president opens the board, we will actually be dropping a new bill because it's got such substantial differences. And obviously, Assembly Stanley, Assemblyman Stanley will sponsor it in the Assembly. And hopefully, we can get this done before we adjourn at the end of December. And our goal is to have it in place for the next school year. So, I mean, I'm open to questions. I know you have a very busy agenda today, so I don't wanna blabber on and on, but, but this is really an exciting thing. And I just can't thank the environmental community enough for, for letting me take credit for something that they really have absolutely positively developed. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, I think we have time for one. Doug, do you, uh, do you wanna take the cue on that? Sure. I mean, I think just one, um, one just kind of obvious question, Senator, you, you know, why, um, you know, there's a lot of vehicles to focus on. Why, why, the, why the focus on school buses? Out of all the vehicles that, you know, you could be, fo be focusing on, why, why are you picking school buses in particular? Because I think by nature, it's a, a finite, controllable, reliable database, you know, as opposed to all the different 
if we went through you know all the public some some publicly held some or not so i just think this is a database that really is reliable and you know if if a, if a school bus uh, doesn't uh, reach a specific uh, designation at a particular time obviously we can deal with that as opposed to public transportation i just i just think it's a more reliable starting point to get reliable data and obviously it's also important that that our kids and communities realize how important this is going forward. And, and certainly we've seen the experience in other states like Massachusetts that have gotten a, out a little ahead of us. I, I always, um, you know, Senator, you'll, you'll remember this, you know, it was more than 15 years ago uh, that we had a ballot question uh, to be able to clean up existing diesel vehicles. Yep. Uh, that ballot question obviously passed. Peg Hanna from DEP helped to implement that program, but it's a reminder of how far we've come. Right, we yeah. can now electrify our vehicles as opposed just to having cleaner versions of. No, we, we have, as I said, using that example of the first car tonight, we have, we have gone light years from where we started, but we still got a long way to go. Wonderful. Thank you uh, so much, Senator uh, and Assemblyman and uh, rock star in the Zoom, Doug O'Malley. Uh, so uh, really appreciate your perspectives and the work you're doing there. And uh, I know that all the folks who are in attendance here today, you know, want to be of assistance to to support your your efforts for sure and getting them all across the finish line so thanks can for your i time. just make it can i just make a comment before of i get course. off and this is a good example of it please don't presume that i or any other member of the legislature and this isn't being funny know the specific concerns that you have the thing that drives me most nuts if i'm out at a restaurant and somebody starts yelling at me about something that i really didn't even know about so please reach out to us give us your input Give us your suggestions. This is really, as, as Doug pointed out, the vote in the assembly, this is really an issue that the vast majority of legislators support, but we need the input of, of the community to, to move it forward. So don't hesitate to call me. And the nice thing about email can be three o'clock in the morning. So just reach out, let us know what's going on. That's a really, really good tip. And I'm sure well taken by uh, all the folks here in the Zoom today. So uh, thank you, Senator. Okay, keep up the good work. You as well. So moving on, we're really uh, grateful to have uh, some some partners in the the private sector space who are going to bring you know some of their examples of you know how do we adopt this technology? Uh, because as we all know, you know at this point we're all uh, early adopters, uh, and uh, we are uh, pleased to be bringing on uh, folks who've you know, who've demonstrated the, the value and the utility of this, uh, this technology, who've been wrestling with its implementation, uh, and um, we'll have some time to kind of hear their kind of best examples of, of what they've learned along the way. Um, but for our uh, industry panel, we have got Orville Thomas, uh, Director of Government Relations at Lion Electric. Uh, we've got Jackie Pirro, VP of Policy at uh, Nuvi Corporation, uh, we've got Matt Stanberry, who's the managing director of Highland Electric, uh, uh, which has a you know a unique and interesting model uh, for EV deployment. Jim Woods, who's the director of business development for First Student, uh, largest uh, school bus uh, contractor in the in the country, maybe in North America, I believe. And then uh, Todd Granica with uh, with PSEG, kind of a late addition to our panel, but we're very glad to have all these folks here who've uh, been uh, kind of on the front lines of dealing with deploying ESBs. What I want to give everyone is a chance to just kind of introduce themselves, introduce their, you know, their, their company and, and the work that they're doing in the electric school bus space to start with. And I'll just go in the order that I, uh, that I initially uh, listed y'all. So Orville, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. You know, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Orville Thomas. As Aaron said, I'm the uh, director of Government Relations for Lion Electric, the first Director of Government Relations, so I take that responsibility uh, very seriously. Uh, Lion Electric is an original uh, equipment manufacturer of all electric, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles. Uh, what I like to say is we produce clean, zero-emission versions of all those uh, vehicles that you see polluting your communities. So uh, delivery trucks, tractors for semis, and most importantly for this conversation, all electric school buses. We have over 400 school buses currently in operation throughout the United States and in Canada uh, with over 7 million miles of data from being driven throughout the communities. You know, as the Director of Government Relations, I get the chance to oversee our 50 state 
and federal strategy, really focusing you know, on what communities and states and legislatures can do to ensure that the policies and the funding are in place uh, to accelerate this transition to all electric school buses. Happy to see New Jersey and hear from you know, first partner uh, Murphy, uh, our elected officials, and to hear from the members of the Murphy administration on what they're doing and what they see happening in the future. You know, when Lyon was applying for some grants from the state, it was great to see that we had over 166 grants to submit. That shows that the community was really willing to take a chance on electric and wanted to be part of this movement to clean up their communities. You know, as an electric vehicle manufacturer, I'm happy to be on this panel and work with some of our partners uh, to make sure that the environment and the re regulatory space is available uh, and ripe for you know, the policies that we heard the Senator talking about. There really is an opportunity with the federal level and the administration uh, in the White House to work with states and to make sure that communities have the cleanest vehicles transporting their children uh, and throughout their community to make sure that we have the cleanest air uh, and replacing the vehicles that, that we know are you know, causing a lot of damage uh, for our neighborhoods. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to the Electrification Coalition and WRI for putting this on. And I'm really looking forward to this panel and having this conversation with you. Right. Uh, thanks for joining us. And I think we're, so right now we're just going to have some introductions and hear a little bit about the kind of you know the deployment uh, efforts you've you've kind of undertaken. So I know that Jackie's got a, a few panel uh, a few sorry uh, a few slides that she wants to share. Jackie, are you comfortable sharing those, or do we need, uh, should we queue this up for you? Should be good. Uh, let me just make sure. Uh, We've had a, it's been a little bit of hit and miss today so far uh, on the sharing of the uh, the slides. So I've got all the faith in the world in you, Jackie, though. Fingers crossed. Okay. Did it work? Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. So I'm Jackie Pirro, uh, and I'm the vice president of policy for Nubi Corporation. We uh, are a software aggregation platform that coordinates, controls, and aggregates electric vehicles. We're particularly interested in bi-directional electric vehicles that can do what's known as vehicle to grid operations, but we're interested in all EVs and really anything else, any other distributed resources that we can combine with them. That could be solar, it could be batteries, it could be even just demand management technologies. We've been working with this technology for a long time and we've been doing it around the world. Uh, we actually have quite a few more deployments in the United States at this point. This is an outdated map and what we're starting to see is actually more and more interest in vehicle to grid across the country, and it is being driven by school buses. Um, this was partly uh, due to the California Energy Commission actually having a funded program, giving uh, the participating companies, Lion was one, uh, and Bluebird was another, giving them a specification for a vehicle to grid capable school bus. And because they did that, you now have V2G capable school buses being sold across the country. But on the more electric side, what I do is try and make sure that the programs that states are employing to actually help schools go electric are truly helpful to schools but also are setting an environment for advanced technologies to be used, whether it's today or a few years down the road. And I wanna commend New Jersey for their, uh, for their work with vouchers. We found that it's not just giving schools money, it's how you give them money that actually can make a huge difference in whether or not they're able to pull the trigger, trigger and electrify. Uh, you know, grants, Grants are hard and they are easy to lose. And if you are able to hire a grant writer, you actually have quite an advantage in that type of environment. We are much, we are finding that schools are much more able and, and willing to engage when they see a more direct process. Rebates are more direct, but you have to have the money up front. And so we just want to commend you and encourage you to expand voucher programs. Uh, but also help schools figure out what they need to do, have step-by-step -step guides. This is confusing. We see schools actually hiring consultants to get them through the process of electrifying their fleets. Um, 
it shouldn't be this hard. <laughs> Uh, but also we see schools needing multiple sources of funding uh, for school bus, for the EBSE, for the infrastructure, and they can end up with incompatible systems that they've cobbled together. And that is the last thing that we want to have happen when you have schools working so hard to actually get there to find that they've ended up at the wrong destination, essentially. Uh, but also just helping accelerate the process. The more time that it actually takes to get the bus the, uh, the less certainty for the school, for the developers, for the manufacturers, and figuring out how to streamline these processes is one of the best, uh, best things that New Jersey can do. But I just wanted to quickly take one more moment to encourage you. I've noticed in the Energy Master Plan, I've noticed in the MDHD straw proposal that V2G is peppered throughout those, and that's great to see. But uh, for example, uh, you know, as, as and I'm not picking on PSCNG, but as I was looking at one of PSCNG's proposal for uh, storage rollout, they were proposing $180 million, uh, I think earlier this year for 35 megawatts of storage. And the, their list of things that they wanna do with that storage can all be done using a V2G resource. These are things that we have actually tested and implemented, and they're not that hard from a technical perspective. What you need is intent. You need the utility to decide that they want to integrate these EVs, not just add them to their grid, to take these 11,000 school buses and make them into part of the energy system, integrate them with all the other pieces that are coming in in the energy master plan. Uh, that is my plea. You're doing great, New Jersey. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, all right, so now I'll turn to Matt Stanberry uh, with, with Highland Electric. Thank you, Aaron. Um, really appreciate uh, the Electrification Coalition and WRI uh, for bringing this uh, event together. And thanks to all the uh, fellow panelists here who are uh, doing everything every day to make this transition possible. Um, and uh, thanks to everybody who's on the line and interested uh, in this and driving leadership in New Jersey um, so we can do wonderful things for our kids. Um, so uh, just to give you a background, my, my uh, name is Matt Samberg, Managing Director at Highland Electric Fleets. Um, we are a company that's 100% focused on helping uh, school districts uh, drive electrification of their school bus fleets at scale. Company is about uh, three years old now, uh, and uh, it was born out of a couple of observations. Um, one, that there were a couple of uh, real positive signs for school bus electrification. There was good commercial product uh, that was available uh, in the market. Um, and two, there was a lot of interest, of course, for all the reasons that all of us know really, really well, um, to have better options in the traditional uh, diesel school buses um, that we've driven forever uh, for schools. Um, the challenges um, were, were numerous, but they really could be distilled down into two big ones. One was sort of obvious. Um, there was a big upfront cost delta uh, for the school buses and charging infrastructure. Uh, and the second was a little less obvious, but just as important actually, which was that it was complex. Um, it was complicated to think about uh, transitioning a fleet at that stage uh, to fully electric. And the way to think about that is uh, if you think about a transportation director's uh, job, um, it really is centers on a North Star of delivering kids safely back and forth from school uh, to home. Um, and when you started to describe to them, we have this great new technology, um, but it's going to require you to change up your depot, dig it up, um, uh, reorient it, um, install new charging infrastructure, uh, and then manage that charging infrastructure to reduce costs and maybe even create some new revenue opportunities. <laughs> Most of them were running for the door uh, at that point. Uh, that was not something that was in their, their comfort zone um, at that stage. And, and that, that's essentially what, what uh, uh, caused the creation of Highland. Was Those were two observable challenges that we felt like we could really help solve. So what the company does is provide a turnkey solution to schools um, to, with the goal of making uh, electrification of school bus fleets simple and affordable. Um, and in fact, we can often drive 
um, uh, on the affordability side, um, schools to a place where they are budget neutral um, in terms of adding new electrics relative to what it would cost to buy and own and operate diesels uh, over their, their lifetime. Um, so the, the company takes on those, those activities that are necessary. We do all the planning for the school districts uh, for electrification over time, plan out the depot uh, uh, changeovers, um, at all the charging infrastructure installation. We buy all the equipment uh, that's necessary, buses, chargers, uh, et cetera, uh, take away that upfront cost uh, for the districts. Uh, and then we manage the charging infrastructure uh, over the course of the project's life. We train the drivers uh, and the mechanics on the technology along with the, the uh, dealers of the, um, uh, along with the OEM's dealers um, or the OEM directly. Uh, and uh, then uh, of course we pay for maintenance of, uh, of the vehicles as well. So you get in one package, um, the things that are necessary to, to electrify. Um, a, a school system. Uh, and uh, we are now um, have the largest school bus electrification project in the country. It's well known out in Montgomery County in Maryland um, and have uh, projects uh, in development across some 20 odd states uh, around the country um, and have now become the largest electric school bus buyer in the country. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to join all of you. I will uh, echo Jackie on many of the, the points that, uh, that she raised uh, around uh, incentive structure, uh, just for flagging. Um, we are super excited about the leadership that New Jersey is showing um, on uh, electrification issues broadly and school buses in particular. Um, and we'd say as as uh, incentive program that's designed, the design of that incentive is really, really important. Um, again, echoing Jackie on that point, what you want to think about is ways to encourage school districts to scale um, their uh, electrification efforts while they need to experience the electric technology. We this this uh, product suite is well tested. We're beyond the stage of needing pilots. Um, so while we call it a pilot program, uh, what we really want to be thinking about is creating seeds for electrification at scale um, through that, that program. And there are specific design elements that you can use to, to do that um, in an incentive program. Also flag on um, the utility regulatory side. Um, it's really important to be thinking about your, your make ready programs. And uh, again, to Jackie's point, V2G programs. Um, and uh, creating that opportunity for grid services to be provided um, to the utilities in the larger electric system uh, for remuneration that can be passed back to the districts um, and uh, help offset that, that upfront cost differential. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Aaron. Um, again, thanks so much for having us. Uh, absolutely, and thanks for your work, Matt. Uh, and. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, those uh, first three speakers, Orville, Jackie, and uh, Matt, all represent uh, uh, corporations who are members of the ECBC, the EC Business uh, Council. So the folks that we are, you know, understand there's a shared agenda to electrify uh, uh, as quickly as possible, and our, uh, you know, interests of full disclosure. I wanted to make sure that was very clear. But uh, but we are excited to hear everyone's perspective on this panel, uh, and really glad that I can turn to Jim Woods right now because I think his perspective is incredibly valuable as we think about scale uh, of ESBs because uh, he's with a company that knows scale for sure. Jim. Uh, good uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you can see my slideshow. Um, just a couple of slides I'm going to share uh, with it, with everybody this morning, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, really, really interesting to hear all the different perspectives on this. Um, you know, clearly everybody's got a commitment to make this happen, and um, it's certainly going to take all of us to do it. Um, my name is Jim Woods with First Student. Um, I've been in the industry for about uh, 40 years. So, uh, Peg Hannah, I got you beat by a little bit. Um, the uh, um, I've seen a lot of things happen over those 40 years, and I think electrification is one of the most exciting things that's, got, that's come down the road. Uh, it's certainly something that, uh, that must happen. I think we've gained a lot of traction in the past 
few years, and you know that's going to accelerate as we go forward. Um, I do I'll want want to also just um, talk about briefly if I can get my show to advance. There we go. Um, uh, I was invited to be here actually through the New Jersey School Bus Contractors Association, of which we're a we're a member, and I think their their perspective on this is really important because New Jersey is a very heavily contracted state. You know, a lot of school districts still run their own, uh, but by far there's a, there's just a ton of uh, school bus, uh, small private uh, school bus contractors. There's a, a couple of, of large companies like First Students, um, but by and large, um, in fact, the New Jersey Contractors Association um, made up of 50 private school bus contractors. These are, you know, active members who who fund the organization, but in reality, there are hundreds of private companies that follow what the Contractors Association does. And we're really, they're in it because, um, you know, they live in, they're invested in their communities. Many of these companies are multi-generational companies that have been transporting students for, for decades and decades. They, uh, they truly care about the, the communities they're in and the students that they transport and, um, and they wanna do the right thing. Um, but as has been mentioned several times, uh, the financial picture on this is, is a challenging one for, you know, for a small company to put out $300,000 for a, a new uh, electric school bus versus you know, 90, 95,000 for a, a, a diesel is a, is a pretty huge investment. So we really, that we really need uh, help in that area, and, you know. Apologies. Um, so I, also important to know that, you know, we work with school districts who have, um, have limited budgets and, you know, they, they really need to focus on education. They need to, to keep as many of those dollars in the classroom as they can. Um, there are su important support services like transportation, food service, uh, a custodial, et cetera, that are, that are often contracted uh, to save money and to gain expertise. But, you know, that's the last place that districts, you know, want to spend their money. They really need to keep it in the classroom. And so, you know, private contractors in New Jersey, you know, want to support electrification, but, but they really need help. Uh, first student, the company I work for and have been with for uh, 38 of the 40 years, um, we are the largest contractor. I think it's probably in the world, um, Aaron. But you know, we operate about forty-three thousand of those four hundred eighty thousand school buses. So about one in eleven bus school buses on the road today uh, is one of ours. We we've got five million student journeys uh, every day, and uh, we really you know take our responsibility very seriously. Uh, you know, we you know we see you know. 30 years ago, it was just get the kids to and from school safely and on time if possible. Now we really see it as, you know, we want to get them there in the right environment. We want to get them there ready to learn with the uh, the right mind frame and, and in a healthy environment. And electrification is a big part of that. It's the uh, it's the right thing to do, not only for the environment, but, um, you know, for for the communities that, that we're involved with. Um, it's also a great financial move for our company in the long term. We just know that uh, the, the maintenance costs are less, the, the, the fuel costs are less. And so that, that is a, another benefit uh, to us. Um, it, it's clear though that, you know, this, this uh, you know, doing one or two buses here and there, you know, up to five buses, which is becoming more and more easy to do um, it is a good start, but it's not the way that we're, we're going to get there. Um, we need to do this on large scale. So as a company, we've made the commitment to convert 20,000 buses in the next 10 years. So more than half of our fleet, we're expecting to be able to be electric. Um, I heard the 2030 timeframe talked about earlier. Um, so, you know, we hope to be at, you know, at 20,000 when we, when we reach that point. So um, uh, obviously, you know, the benefits of, of uh, electrifying the bus. I wanna talk about some of the things that we've done so far, and then I'll turn it back over. Um, so 
Uh, we started in 2019 with a couple of uh, 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 electric bus pilots out in Rochester, Minnesota, a few other places. Um, one of the things that we've done that I think is going to help us to really gain and, and accelerate um, our our projects is we we formed a joint venture company with NextEra Energy. NextEra is the the world's largest uh, wind and solar energy company, and it's really important for two reasons. One is because infrastructure is one of the biggest challenges. Actually, getting uh, enough energy to a site to be able to to power 50 or 100 or more buses is is really a significant task. You know, we're finding that you know putting five buses on a site with a you know a $1,500 charger not too difficult. Um, doing 50 buses is entirely a, a different story. The second thing that that uh, is important about NextEra Energy and our partnership there is that, you know, when we, you know, powering buses with electricity, if it's, um, for lack of a better word, dirty electricity, all we've done is we've moved the pollution from um, where the students are, which is a great move, but we just put it somewhere else in somebody else's community where, you know, they're burning coal or burning something else to create that electricity. So making the move to, to wind and solar uh, energy really uh, makes it a complete process of, of cleaning up um, the service that we do. Uh, we also have a, a um, an agreement with Lion Bus. Uh, you may have heard um, and appreciate Orville being on the call. Um, we are uh, purchasing 260 electric school buses for our operation in Quebec, Canada. And, you know, purchasing in large volume is, is really key uh, as was mentioned earlier, because it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. If we, you know, if we don't have the volume to dri drive down pricing, then, you know, buses are going to continue to be expensive, but somehow we got to get beyond that hurdle of that initial expense. So one of the other things we're doing is uh, we are, we're actively seeking grants. We hired a third party company to, uh, who's really just super, super good at uh, putting in applications for grants and seeking the, the ARP monies, the DIRA monies, Volkswagen grants, and um, you know, using whatever state and federal funding we can to replace our older diesel fleet. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, and it's, again, this has been mentioned several times, and I appreciate what you know what Highland mentioned about the way they're helping to simplify things and make it easier for school districts. You know, for our school district customers, we put together a very clear. Uh, roadmap on on how to take this process forward and really to take take the effort off their hands. So you know we're already providing the bus and the driver and everything else with that and and to help our school districts get to their end goal of of providing the the right environment for their students. We, we we've got a very clear roadmap that helps us to uh, to get to that end goal uh, on scale in, in the easiest way possible. So. Um, as I mentioned, we need help in the financial aspect of things. Um, we need, you know, significant grants to get us there until such time as we can really, you know, get enough purchasing volume to companies like Lion Electric to be able to bring the, the cost of the bus down uh, because, you know, school districts have limited budgets and, um, you know, we need to be able to do it, do it at a, at a near diesel equivalent cost uh, if they're going to be able to to, to do that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, and yeah, thanks for the New Jersey School Bus Contractors Association for connecting us and for your uh, your kind of membership and engagement there. So uh, next, I want to turn over to uh, Todd Hranica. Maybe I got that last name right, or maybe I didn't at all uh, with, uh, with PSEG. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, you did great. If you can imagine growing up with this last name, it's been mispronounced a zillion times. It's uh, it's Haronica. So good morning to all. My name is um, Todd Haronica. I'm the director of solar energy, electric vehicles and energy storage for public service electric and gas, which is based uh, here in New Jersey and Newark. Um, I'm pleased to be here this morning to contribute to this important topic. I, I would tell you that um, we're, we're real proud. January of this year, we were approved by the Board of Public Utilities for 166 million investment program in charging infrastructure to facilitate EV adoption across a broad range of customers and segments. 
And last, last month, we launched our automated platform for that program. Uh, our electric vehicle program is part of our broader PSE and G clean energy future vision. Uh, we plan to file a comprehensive medium heavy duty program by February of next year. Uh, and I think, you know, from our perspective, we believe that climate change represents one of the preeminent challenges of our time. As New Jersey's largest utility, we believe we play an important role in mitigating the potential impacts of climate change in our state. And then uh, I'm sure as everyone on this webinar realizes, uh, transportation is the largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in New Jersey and electric school buses are emissions free. So they, they provide a primary strategy for improving air quality in our overburdened communities. And, and just as our overburdened communities have suffered disproportionately from vehicle emissions, they will see the greatest benefit from electrification. Uh, I look forward to learning from our fellow panelists this morning about this critical initiative, especially Jackie, in regard to the V2G opportunities. Jackie, I'll tell you that uh, that filing was made in 2018, so industry has made significant strides in the past three years, and I, I welcome the opportunity to, uh, to discuss with you further uh, after, the, after the panel. That's it for me, Aaron. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Todd. Uh, well, so yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that. Three years is a lifetime in the 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 changes we've seen in the landscape, right? So, did Highland even exist three years ago? Now Highland has the largest single deployment, uh, you know, kind of on the books and on the schedule uh, in Montgomery Montgomery County, Maryland, I believe, with three hundred twenty six buses. Yeah, which when I first reached out to folks in New Jersey about, you know, having this conversation, it was like, yeah, we just need to find out why, why wasn't it in New Jersey? What do we, that's what we need to know is why, do, why were we, you know, there's a little bit of chat, you know, kind of competition, I think in the region, but, uh, but no, like what's, what are the factors that, you know, you guys looked for, uh, Matt, you know, and in terms of the scale question, because that really is it. I think we're going to hear a video or in a little bit, from a school district in Maryland, uh, Michigan, rather, who you know did four buses and have deployed them, and they've had a great experience with them. But you know, four to fifty-two, which is their com complete fleet, like we can't do it. You know, a few at a time if we're going to get to the goals of established for ourselves or our society to make sure that the you know the kids that we're taking to school uh, have a habitable planet to, you know, to proceed on uh, after they're done with school. So you know, the time is of the essence. Uh, the status quo is our enemy and we need to scale as quickly as possible. And I just, I, I want to turn to Highland because I think you've, you've, you've shown the foray that is really pretty impressive in terms of the numbers. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of what are the factors that went into that? And, you know, if you were going to tell, you know, uh, some of our panelists here, the folks we just heard from, uh, how to structure things so we could do more of that across the uh, New Jersey and the Garden State and across the country, uh, we'd love to hear your insights. Uh, thanks for, for that question, Aaron, and I won't pretend to, to tell Jim and his, his team and, and others about, you know, how, how they're doing it there. Everybody is uh, making strides. I think Jim rightly pointed out, we all got to be out there uh, doing this. It's such a large fleet for us to turn over. Um, and all of us have, have got to be putting our shoulder to the wheel. And uh, I'm really happy to be up here with uh, a bunch of the folks who are. So, uh, you know, a couple of observations um, from, uh, you know, Montgomery, uh, but also, you know, the school districts that we're engaged with around the country, we're probably on the phone with transportation directors around the country, you know, three or four of them a day, uh, if not more than that. Um, and so there's a lot of interest out there. I think that the ingredients, I think your question, Aaron, sort of boils down to the ingredients for scale. Um, and um, I think at, at its core um, are uh, how you handle the, the economics. Um, and so there are, you know, key uh, questions um, that uh, districts and folks helping them have to, have to wrestle. Um, it, it really takes planning up front um, so if you come in with the mindset of I'm going to start with a single deployment, you're, you're sort of dead before you start <laughs> in terms of being able to, uh, to achieve scale. Um, you've got to be thinking about how do I set myself up to enable that scale? So I've got to plan for it. How do I limit the number of times that I'm breaking ground um, on 
uh, on you know busting up concrete uh, to lay in um, infrastructure. I mean, Todd can tell you um, how how hard that is in 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 projects. Um, you know, we've got just to take Montgomery as an example. Um, there was a depot that we electrified, the first of the five depots from Montgomery in the span of four months, um, and brought new five new megawatts of of service to that site. Uh, but that was a, a depot that was well set up for it. Other depots were going to take two years um, to, to develop out. And so you've really got to be planning holistically up front about how you're going to progressively electrify over time, which allows you to drive better economic decisions um, throughout the process. So that's, that, that's part of it. I think another part of it is um, looking for um, a... Uh, an actively engaged community um, and um, really having the support for the school system um, that's out there. Um, these are big decisions that they're making. Um, they're big investment decisions that they're making. Uh, we refer to it as it's, it takes a village, right? Um, for, for these kind of transitions. Um, and so there are a lot of questions to, to be answered um, and uh, they're gonna need the engagement uh, for uh, from the whole community uh, to, to, to answer all those questions and, and move the ball continuously down the field. Um, and I think one of the wonderful things about starting with school buses, I had a question earlier about why do you start with school buses at the state? Um, and uh, part, of the, part, part of the value is that school buses provide value to so many different parts of the community. I mean, obviously the kids, but the local community around the schools that experience the pollution from diesel buses, um, the, uh, the, the drivers who can get trained up on a new technology going forward. Uh, we, uh, we actually have a driver up in our Beverly, Massachusetts deployment that refers, the, his kids refer to his electric bus as the magic bus, it's just a better experience. Um, and uh, it's a better driving experience. And so schools right now have a tremendous shortage of drivers in, in general. Jim can tell you all, all, all about that, I'm sure. Um, and the reality is that driving electrics is a better experience and it helps with driver retention um, and attracting new drivers. So there's just all these values that school buses provide. And so that presents the seeds for engaging the community in supporting uh, electrification. So those are, you know, there's a lot to it, but those are a couple of the things that I would throw out there, uh, Aaron, as key ingredients. Wonderful. That's great and super helpful. Uh, Jackie, I know you guys have done a lot of work at the kind of the data side of this, looking at how V2G works. I think that's, there's a lot of interest, right? As you said, it's, you know, it's a, it's a phrase that's used a lot as we look in the, into this space, but I do think it's one that we haven't exactly grappled with uh, effectively, uh, but if we are going to do scale, we need to know it. We need to know kind of best practices. So what would you share? Like, what are some of the things that you've identified in your analysis of, you know, of the kind of initial forays that you think need to be replicated moving forward, especially as, you know, as, as some of the, the folks in New Jersey are thinking about this? Question. I think, uh, <laughs> You know, of, of course, we're interested in uh, in having value streams that would normally be accessible to stationary storage and other demand response resources be accessible to aggregation species. But how, why we want that and how we get there, I think, is the important thing. Uh, we don't want it because we're a private company trying to make money. We want it because, similar to Highland Electric, we wanna try and take the adoption of electric school buses to a pace that moves beyond the pace of subsidies that are provided. We want to be able to have a continually accelerating, self-sustaining curve of adoption. And to do that, we need to figure out how to make it affordable for, uh, for schools and how to make it a good business proposition for manufacturers and for service providers. So I think it needs to actually be more of an outcome-based uh, planning process, meaning first, you could say, how, what exactly do we want to do with our EVs? And I don't think that's necessarily uh, how to get there. You can end up with analysis paralysis very quickly. But what you can say is we want to have as wide a range of options for what this bi-directional big battery can be doing when it is parked. 
And to do that, you can start at the beginning with the way that transportation electrification programs are done, with the way that make ready is done. You can put in place the conditions for these EVs to be used in multiple ways. And that can mean looking for rates that actually uh, don't disincentivize bi-directional usage of these vehicles, uh, meaning some kind of compensation that you would see along the lines of what you're seeing for uh, storage or for solar, but also not requiring a separate service or a specific rate that only allows an EV to actually be sitting in a parking lot. This is something we've experienced in California. Um, in, in the interest of simplicity of, of a straightforward billing process, we've ended up with EVs that are isolated on parking lots with no other loads, with their very own rate. And that essentially, rather than integrating EVs to the grid, you are adding them to the grid. You are not making them of any use. You are simply trying to make them predictable loads and they can be so much more. Um, when we look, I think, at the future of New Jersey's plans of the energy master plan of, of the offshore wind resource that we see starting to gather steam off the East Coast, we need to think about what will EVs be in relation to that? How will, how will companies be able to actually work with utilities and work with schools to actually make sure that EVs facilitate that offshore wind rather than exacerbating any issues that might come up from it? Um, we are confident that this is real. We are confident that there is a business model that's developing. We have actually formed a joint venture uh, called Levo that is dedicated to doing, to creating financing, creating a turnkey solution, because we believe that we will be able to finance electric, uh, electric school buses and their infrastructure over the life of the vehicle based only on the revenues that we see developing. Those are behind the meter revenues like uh, bill, uh, bill mitigation, uh, which is an avoided cost value stream, but it's demand response. It's the way that FERC 2222 is starting to change the, uh, the PJM interconnect. We see that this is going to be real and we're investing in it. And I hope everyone else will too. Uh, great. Thanks, Jackie. I guess a question that's coming in from the audience, what, uh, when you're looking at, so Jim, you're, you, that is a very ambitious goal, which is you know wonderful because that's what we need is those types of ambitious uh, efforts to be not just talked about, but met. And as you're thinking about that transition, are you guys uh, thinking about retrofitting or is it all new buses or, you know, is it a mix or, you know, have you, have you run the numbers? What seems most kind of appealing to you guys as, uh, as a very, very, very large uh, in, in endeavor in this world? Oh, that's a great question. I, I actually did a project in Connecticut uh, recently where we did look at uh, the, the company name escapes me, but there is a company out there that's taking um, buses in around the 2006 range and actually retrofitting them with their electric power plant um, and basically giving you another you know, 10, 12 years of life. Um, we, we didn't choose to go that way. We are at this point choosing to go with all new uh, equipment and you know the medium duty school bus uh, for the most part has a, a 12 year sometimes in New Jersey like we have around a 15 year life um, and you know that seems to make the most sense at least it has in the it has in the diesel world um, you know once you get into 200 thousand 250 thousand mile range the 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 uh, maintenance expenses tend to overcome the you know the, the cost of a new bus um, so. At this point, we are going all all new. But as we think about maintenance costs, we obviously do know that you know ESBs have much lower maintenance costs. Uh, is that something that potentially means the lifespan for these vehicles is longer? I don't know, Jim. If you've got insights or or Orville, uh, but you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the. You know, are we are we changing the math somewhat? Uh, and as we do our modeling basing it on old information or, or where are we? You're right. At? I think it's a great point. I think New Jersey was smart uh, several years ago to extend the, the life of the school bus in New Jersey to 15 years. I think the electric bus and, and Orville can certainly support this. I think the electric bus is going to last longer. You know, one of the, the uh, uh, prohibitive cost factors when a bus gets to 12 years old 
uh, diesel bus. And, you know, if you happen to lose an engine, it's a significant investment to put a new diesel power plant in. Uh, I think you will find it's not going to be the same. I mean, battery costs, uh, I think we'll find out over time. Um, and certainly as, as batteries are produced uh, in greater volume in North America, I think those costs will come down as well. But, but Aaron, I think it's a great point that the life of the vehicle can very easily uh, be moved out beyond that 12 to 15 year, year window, um, which you know, is going to make uh, other states that ha haven't done what New Jersey did you know, reconsider their funding formulas to, to um, you know, move out beyond the 10, 12 year range. Yeah, and I think, hold on really quick, Jim, you kind of set me up perfectly because at Lion, we are in the process of building a battery manufacturing plant in North America to do some of those things that you, you know, talked about where we could control the price point and start controlling the supply chain of the battery manufacturing process and then be able to pass some of those savings along to customers, uh, local governments, and, you know, hopefully those that want to implement uh, greater uh, amounts of electric school buses. And when we think about the lifespan, you know, we want to talk about the data that we're seeing and how that battery is holding up really well compared to, you know, previous uh, projections. And what we could then think through, and Matt, you're probably thinking this with your uh, partners, is what that battery allows the customer to do throughout the whole lifespan. And as the technology and the battery gets better, you might be able to swap out a current battery to a industrial purpose for residential purposes for others, and then put in a brand new battery at a lower price point that has greater range and faster charge up capabilities into the existing electric school bus framework. So there's a lot that goes on and it's great that we have this technological marvel of an electric school bus that does allow us to like really forecast into 10 to 20 years down the line and how the technology that's in the bus itself and powers the bus will become better just through practices and greater resources. Uh, but that also, you know, to Jim's point, the amount of moving parts is so much reduced in electric school buses compared to internal combustion engines that obviously we'll start seeing longer savings. We'll see less brake pad wear and tear we'll see greater transitions and savings on the maintenance side uh, so that hopefully, you know, the school district itself or the partners that are providing the buses uh, will see a greater return on that investment. Thanks Orville. Yeah, good point. Uh, and then as we, you know, as we kind of look forward, uh, you know, we, we want to look forward, right? Because this has been a really rough year and a half. I got to imagine it's been rough for everyone, but school buses, have been, I think, uniquely hit, uh, and you know, contractors and, and whatnot. I'd be interested. Is there anything that you know you guys have learned from this time in the pandemic? You know, in terms of prioritization or planning moving forward. I just, I'd hate to think that we went through this, you know, hopefully incredibly unique time, and we didn't learn something in terms of uh, how we're how we're moving forward with electric school buses. I'll just throw that open to the to the panel. If anyone's got an, an insight or a story they want to share. I mean, one of the things that we've uh, noticed, and I'd be curious as to the other panelists' um, uh, thoughts on this, is if we've seen in the midst of COVID an incredible increase in interest um, in electric school buses, which is remarkable and great news um, in our um, in our estimation. I mean, as you rightly point out, Aaron, I mean, it, this has been chaotic for schools uh, dealing with COVID. Um, and uh, trying to figure out how to keep kids and teachers safe. Um, and yet in the midst of all of that, we see this real rise um, of uh, transportation directors, school boards, superintendents saying, hey, wait a minute, I, I have actually heard about what this technology can do. And I think there's a moment here where we're worried about kids' safety um, and if we're worrying about airborne, um, you know, disease that, you know, does create this opening of thinking around, well, maybe we should be controlling more of that um, and really exposing our kids to, to less pollution in addition to, to less viral particle. Um, so I, I think that's, that's been really interesting for us to, to observe over the last, you know, year and a half and hopefully not <laughs> too much more than that. Yeah, I think, you know, building off of what Matt said, 
uh, it's great to see the interest. And I feel like there's this first generation of electric school buses that have been in operation throughout the country that people are starting to do studies on and get a lot of technical information from and, you know, experiences and the stories are starting to, you know, reach other communities around them. Uh, it's great. I don't want to, you know, curse the political process right now that we're seeing in DC. Uh, but I think electric school buses might be moving to postpartisan. We just delivered at Lyon the first electric school bus in the state of Tennessee. We just delivered the first electric school bus for the state of Maine. Uh, you know, we have it in more rural areas of Michigan, uh, Missouri. And we're starting to see, you know, that a lot of communities that have been traditionally, uh, you know, oil dependent or looking at other uh, forms of power for school buses, that they're embracing the thought of electric and all electric. And so that is good to know. Uh, you know, one thing I think that COVID has shown us that we have to improve upon is the supply chain and the logistics of getting the parts for all these buses together. And, you know, it's a big thing for Lion. I think it's a real reason why we're building our own manufacturing plant and battery manufacturing plant. Uh, we'll have the capacity with our new manufacturing plant in Joliet, Illinois, to build 20,000 all electric, medium, heavy duty vehicles a year which is 10 times the scale that we currently operate at now. Uh, and we have to, because the need is coming in, as Matt pointed out, there's so much more interest that we can't be dependent upon these shipping shortages or delays that are gonna be with us for the next two to three years to slow down this much needed uh, movement into all electric school buses. Well, I hate, I hate to cut this panel off, because uh, Orville knows like my sweet spot, like we said supply chains and let's dig in there. But, uh, but unfortunately we do have a very tight agenda. Uh, and I wanna thank you all for so be, being so generous with your time here today with us. Uh, and I, I know that you know, you've been fantastic partners in sharing this information and I'm sure you'll be responsive if, if anyone wants to reach out as well. But uh, we are gonna, uh, we're gonna move on now. We, we have a world premiere video uh, for the folks here in the Zoom, which is pretty exciting. Uh, this is a, a case study looking at Zeeland, uh, Michigan. Uh, and I do wanna thank Orville for uh, pointing out that deployment as a, as a place to, to, to look at uh, in terms of you know, what they've learned and how they're moving forward with ESBs uh, in, a, in a rural community in Michigan. Uh, but yes, for the first time for any sort of a public audience, I would like to present to you uh, the Zealand case study. There goes one. <laughs> That's the noise you hear when they go slow. That's electric bus. The, the electric buses are great. They are so much cleaner for the kids, for their breathing. The diesel, they smell more. The electric is clean. They love riding on it. I love going to work in the morning. I love being able to get on my bus and do what I do. It's a great bus to have. Zealand Public Schools is very proud of the fact that we went forward with an opportunity that was unique and innovative. We have these buses now, the electric ones in our fleet, amongst other buses. Our drivers have taken on the opportunity and they've really been trailblazers with the experience. And our director of transportation is proud to continue the legacy that our former transportation director started with this project. And we just hope to be able to support others that might be looking at those. Electric buses are the future, but they're now. Uh, they're clean running. Your drivers are going to like them. Why not be part of the future and make it now? But then the other thing of it is, is we're transporting America's most precious cargo. And clean air, can you put a price tag on clean air for kids whose lungs are developing? You know, uh, you're dealing with from kindergarten through 12th grade, and we know that their bodies are developing, their lungs are developing, their brains are developing, and the cleaner air they have, 
the better it is for them. We have our four electric buses and we have four different routes that they are on. Two of those routes are uh, longer routes. They go more out into the country and they put on more miles per day than, than the other two. And the other two we keep in town and they um, handle some of our town routes. The more we read about electric school buses and the more um, that the technology advances, we realize that the range is just getting better and better every year. If we take our foot off the accelerator a little earlier than what we normally would have, we can use that braking system to put a charge back into our bus. I've never had an issue with the charging in the cold. Talking about the cost in terms of the savings over the life of the, of the purchase really made sense when we think about 17 cents per mile compared to about 40 to 43 cents per mile for a regular uh, standard operating bus. It does make sense, but we needed those, those supplemental funds to get us through the initial, initial purchase. And we put the process together and wrote the grant. So it was sent to Eagle and put into the award for 70% of the cost of the buses. So each of the districts had to pay close to just over 100000 to be in the game per bus. Put that amount in, so that was a commitment from them, and then Ego covered the other 70%. This actual grant opportunity was a similar opportunity where we could write not just for Zeeland Public, but for other schools that had interest uh, in the opportunity. So I'd say if there's opportunities for us to do that again, we certainly would, and we could give them you know, input from our own experience. But just to consider the impact on the environment, um, the, the shelf life of these, the quiet operation, there's a number of great uh, reasons why this might be something to look at. The manufacturers have been very responsive to us in um, trying to work on this project together and trying to partner with us on these things. When you read about electric vehicles and you read about electric buses and even electric semi-trucks, you think that's far away. And so for our drivers and for our department and for our teachers and for our students here, uh, we get to read about that and see how the country is kind of shifting in that direction and we get to say, yeah, we're already doing that. Okay, there it was, the world premiere uh, of our our video of Zeeland Public Schools in Michigan. Uh, really great folks there, really uh, accommodating and generous with their time as we put that video together. So we're gonna now go ahead and move on to, uh, to our next speaker. Uh, I was gonna delve into an issue that I know, well, I don't know. I think, if you're at all like me, this is really interesting to you. Uh, so maybe no one else shares that. What's going on in Washington, DC? And is it gonna help school buses or not? We've got uh, Trisha uh, Della Icano, and I'm sure I mangled that as well. Uh, she is with Moms Clean Air Force. Uh, she's the national field and legislative manager. Uh, so she is bringing uh, the voices and the stories of concerned parents from across the country to, uh, to members of uh, Congress and to, uh, to engage folks to, uh, to hold uh, legislators accountable to the interest of moms and we like to, you know, we like to work with moms because, you know, it's hard to talk to apple pie, uh, but, you know, they are certainly really important and, you know, evocative and powerful. Uh, and uh, Trisha, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your perspective of, uh, you know, what's going on, the craziness in Washington, D.C. And I did want to just point out, I am, in fact, a Kentucky voter, but I didn't vote for Mitch McConnell. So whatever he's doing back there, please do not blame me. You got it. No problem. We're going to use your uh, advocacy in, in Kentucky to help move things along over there. I think that sounds better. Um, thank, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me here. Um, and, and I'll just follow up on one last thing, Erin. As we just heard in the video, um, you know, this, this issue is near and dear to Moms Clean Air Force's heart as we're transporting America's most precious cargo. So uh, we are have been huge advocates for the um, the transition to electric school buses, but 
first, I'm just thrilled to, to join this conversation with esteemed thought leaders who are leading the way towards electrifying our nation's school buses right here in my own backyard. Um, thank you, Electrification Coalition and the World Resource Institute for inviting me to participate in today's conversation. And thank you, huge thank you to uh, First Lady of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy and Congressman Frank Pallone for all of the work they're doing right here in New Jersey and in Congress to help transition our state's diesel school buses to clean electric buses. For those who do not know me, I am Trisha Dello Iacono. You got it close, Erin. Um, the Senior Legislative Manager for Moms Clean Air Force. And I live here in New Jersey, Mullica Hill, New Jersey with my four young children and husband. Um, so who's Moms Clean Air Force? We're a community of over 1.2 million members across the country, and we have more than 25,000 moms and dads right here in New Jersey. We are united against air pollution and climate change to protect our children's health. We fight for justice in every breath, uh, and that means we recognize the importance of equitable solutions in addressing air pollution and climate change. We have a vibrant network of state-based state community organizers who work on national and local policy issues. We meet with lawmakers at every level of government and on both sides of the political aisle to build support for equitable, just, and healthy solutions to pollution. I like, as Orville pointed out earlier, um, I think he said it was, we're push partisan or past partisan. Uh, we consider ourselves mom partisan because protecting kids' health should never be a partisan issue. Our mission is to protect children from air pollution and climate change. We envision a safe, stable, and equitable future where all children can breathe clean air. We have been one of a number of organizations that has been leading the charge along with our partners to advance the transition to electric school buses. Parents wanna make sure our children's places of learning are healthy and safe environments in which our children can thrive, including the way that they get to and from school. Transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in New Jersey and in the US at large, and is a major contributor to air pollution. Trucks and buses have an outside impact on air quality and they threaten the health of our children every day, including from the diesel field school buses that they ride on. 95% of our nation's iconic yellow school buses still emit harmful diesel emissions. This means that every day, millions of children across the country hop onto school buses that run on dirty diesel engines. And I'll share a little bit about how that harms their health. Um, diesel pollution can trigger asthma attacks and it interferes with our children's ability to learn. It's a known human carcinogen and the tiny particles in the diesel pollution actually um, lodge deep in the lungs and they cause irritation. In addition to short-term problems like coughing, headaches, and nausea, breathing these fumes has been shown to damage both the lungs and the heart. And what's more, children are actually more vulnerable to diesel pollution than adults because their young lungs and hearts are working harder than those of adults and they take more breaths and their hearts beat faster. Their organ systems are still growing, especially their lungs, and those aren't actually fully mature until around the age of 20. So you can see why transitioning away from diesel trucks, diesel buses is so important to Moms Clean Air Force. What's more, the air inside a school bus can actually be more polluted than outside of it. Diesel pollution seeps inside the bus cabin from tailpipes and then gets trapped inside. That means that children may be getting an extra large dose of diesel pollution during their school commute. I'm gonna share a story of a dear friend and mother who lives in Nevada, whose children attend a Title I school. Her name is Jen Cantley, and she is the mom to three young boys. Both Jen and her son Gabriel suffer from asthma that is made worse by air pollution. Recently, the air quality where Jen lives in Northern Nevada was ca categorized as very unhealthy due to the nearby wildfire smoke. I think many of you are familiar with this because it impacted our home all the way over here in New Jersey as well. Um, Jen has shared with me often the struggles that she and Gabriel have been having with their asthma and breathing. Just going outside from the house to the car causes Jen and Gabriel to have asthma attacks. Because the air quality, like I said, inside a diesel school bus can be up to 10 times worse than the air outside, Jen often struggles with whether she should allow her ch children to ride the school bus to school each morning. As I said, diesel is known to aggravate asthma. Jen knows that riding in a diesel fueled school bus can make Gabriel's asthma even worse, and no parent wants to put a child into harm's way. But it's not just the asthma attacks that Moms Clean Air Force are concerned about. 
Diesel buses run on fossil fuels and the pollution from their tailpipes make climate change worse. We parents know climate change is a health crisis. It's harming our communities and our families right now. As the tornado that ripped through my tiny town in Southern New Jersey last month showed us, climate change is literally knocking on our doors. It's rattling our windows and disrupting our lives in significant ways, destroying homes, drowning people inside their apartments and more. I'm thrilled to share some of the exciting efforts that are happening both in Washington, DC right now and across the country to help advance the adoption of electric school buses in every school in America. We're gonna show a short video. Um, this past summer, Moms Clean Air Force co-hosted more than 18 Let's Get Rolling events where we partnered with Lion Electric, uh, Highland and many others here today um, to, to build support for clean electric school buses. You can hit play. So as you can see from Nevada to Delaware, we've been calling on Congress to make bold investments in clean transportation infrastructure, especially electric powered school buses. Moms Clean Air Force members and field organizers have been meeting with their elected leaders from local school board, school board officials to government agencies, including White House officials, to advocate for the transition to a cleaner, healthier commute for our kids, to and from their places of learning. This outpouring, outpouring of support for the transition to electric school buses has been getting enormous attention, especially at the federal level. As Jim mentioned earlier in one of the panels, school districts have limited budgets and we need federal support to help fuel this transition to electric school buses. I'm thrilled to announce that just this last week, the EPA announced new resources on their website that highlight best practices for reducing mobile sources of pollution at schools which includes a call to transition our diesel polluting school buses to clean electric buses. To help expedite this transition, the EPA also announced $7 million for electric school bus rebates in underserved communities through the recently passed American Rescue Plan of 2021 to address disproportionate environmental and public health impacts in minority and low income communities. The 2021 American Rescue Plan Electric School Bus Rebate Program will offer $7 million to eligible school districts and private fleet owners for the replacement of old diesel school buses with new electric buses. And just this past August, the Senate passed, and Congressman Plo mentioned this earlier, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or the BIF. This bill would devote $2.5 billion to 100% clean electric school buses and includes an additional 2.5 billion that electric school bus manufacturers could compete for to clean up our diesel polluting school buses. And as the Congressman mentioned earlier this morning, uh, Congress is also working on this kind of dual track process to pass both the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as well as a budget reconciliation bill or the Build Back Better Act, which would help drive the transition to electric vehicles including school buses through a series of grants, tax incentives, and manufacturing credits. The Build Back Better Act is a massive investment package containing many of President Biden's policy priorities, including multiple critical climate and health provisions that will put our families on a path toward climate safety. Outside of these two historic infrastructure investments, members of Congress have also championed standalone bills that focus on transitioning our fleet of diesel school buses to zero emission buses. The Clean Commute for Kids Act, introduced in both the House and the Senate by Reps Johanna Hayes and Tony Cardenas and Senators Alex Padilla and Raphael Warnock, directs $25 billion to the EPA to transition diesel school buses to zero emission electric buses. In addition, the Clean School Bus Act, formally introduced by the now Vice President Kamala Harris and picked up by Senators Catherine Cortez Masto and Patty Murray, and Representatives Johanna Hayes 
and Tony Cardenas establishes a clean bus school program at the Department of Energy to replace diesel school buses with electric school buses, invest in charging infrastructure, and support the transition to workforce development. Both these pieces of legislation, if passed into law, would help electrify our nation's fleet of yellow school buses, address our climate crisis, and protect children's health from harmful diesel pollution. Both bills prioritize replacing school buses that serve students eligible for free or reduced lunches, which shows a commitment to environmental justice in communities that need it the most. And both these bills would make historic investments in cleaning up the pollution that our children are unnecessarily exposed to during their commute to and from school every day. Electrifying our school buses is a win-win for the health of our kids and for the climate. We've seen an outpouring of grassroots advocacy supporting this effort, as well as robust leadership from this Congress and the Biden administration. Moms will continue to call for electrification of the school bus fleet. I am optimistic that my youngest child, Josie, at just one year of age, will never have to breathe harmful diesel fumes while riding on a school bus. Thank you. That is uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Trisha. So I guess the advocacy you guys do uh, seems incredibly powerful and important. What would you say to somebody who, you know, isn't a member of the Moms Clean Air Force, but wants to support, you know, the kind of the work you're doing to uh, to engage lawmakers and to advocate uh, on behalf of these, you know, these uh, very important programs? Because it does seem like every time I look, it's on the you know, maybe this is just the media, but it looks like the thing is about to fall apart and we are never going to pass anything. So what do you think, you know, people should be doing to elevate their voices? Maybe you're, you know, maybe you're a big Canadian corporation. You're thinking about how you should engage in this space, or maybe you are, uh, you know, a local school board member, uh, or maybe you're a, tra a tra school bus transportation individual. How should people be engaging and, and what should they be saying right now? Absolutely. And it's funny you mentioned our friends at Lion uh, because we've actually partnered on um, on uh, on meeting with lawmakers together. Uh, and and the, the great thing about the school bus kind of coalition and, the, and this effort to electrify our school buses. And I think why we've you know, one of the reasons we've been so successful is the kind of matrix of partners that we've built. Um, and we, we all have, you know, an end goal. Um, whether it's for different reasons, but obviously, but to get our kids on more electric school buses. So if you are tuning in and, and um, not connected to Moms Cleaner First, I would say I'll put my email in the chat and you can connect with me. Um, the biggest thing is to tell your story to your lawmakers, continue to advocate, uh, advocate for the need to transition our school buses to get your kids off those diesel buses. As I said, uh, my daughter Josie is just one years old and, and I hope that when she gets to be uh, school age that I don't have to put her on a diesel pollute, polluting bus and, and we have an electric bus in our community. Um, meet with your school board officials, your superintendents, get them on board, explain to them the benefits. We have a handy resource. I'll also put it in the chat from Moms Clean Air Force on the benefits of, uh, of electric school buses that could be helpful in talking about how this benefits your child personally. Um, and, and just, uh, you know, reach out. There's plenty of thought leaders in this panel and many are, are, you know, I think all of us are more than willing to talk to you and, and help you get involved. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think we're going to need to move on uh, to our next presentation, uh, which I think is me. So uh, sorry, you're gonna have to listen to me a little bit longer, folks. But Trisha, thanks again for your engagement throughout the course of the day and, you know, the information you shared uh, and the perspective you bring to us. So, um, and, and I do hope we hear more of you because this is my, my plug right now. We are gonna go to a lunch break after I'm done talking. Uh, and then when we come back, we are going to go into a, um, a new meeting. So there's, we're gonna put a link in the chat. You need to register for the new meeting because this is a webinar and we can't do breakout rooms, but we really wanna do breakout rooms so everyone has a chance to share their ideas. So we've got four different uh, sessions to choose from. Uh, I think we do have like a poll. So when you come back, you can like, can let people know uh, where you want to go, but uh, we absolutely uh, encourage everyone. We've had, you know, over a hundred of uh, folks throughout the course of the day uh, engaged here. I'd like to see as many of you as possible back into those breakouts to share your ideas. So we can think, think through uh, how to, you know, how to advance uh, electric school bus deployment in New Jersey. Uh, and that, uh, that those will start up at 1.30. So uh, that we're going to take an hour break 
I'm going to try to close out in 10 minutes, give you guys an hour for lunch, uh, and then come back to uh, to go to those uh, to those uh, breakouts. So uh, that's that's the drill. All right, so next steps, folks. Uh, and I think it's really important that uh, you use cute kids in all your uh, promotional efforts, all your advocacy, because who can say no to this kid? Um, next step, next slide. And this is actually a fact sheet that we've got. Uh, we've just kind of hot off the presses. We're releasing it uh, with an eye towards, you know, communities that are thinking about how they want to uh, deploy ESBs in their, uh, in you know, in their neighborhoods through their schools. Uh, and it's kind of a step-by-step -step process of thinking thinking through that. So, you know, first off, you're going to want to engage stakeholders, and you see that list there. It is an enormous number of people that have a stake in uh, in getting kids to school safely, uh, and you're going to want to talk to all of them. Uh, so I don't, I don't want this to be daunting. Uh, I think it, you know, uh, but it is absolutely critical to engage as many voices as possible because next slide, uh, stakeholders can then become partners, right? Folks who will step in, step up uh, and help, you know, you know, bring in resources, bring in, uh, you know, do the heavy lifting to, uh, to make this transition possible. Next step. Next slide. Uh, and then as you set your goals, you know, based on IPCC or your state climate goals or, you know, what you think is uh, appropriate for your school district, you know, work backwards from there uh, and, uh, and seek to deploy what you need. Uh, next step. Uh, and then, of course, which we've heard. I won't say broken record uh, because no one knows what a record is anymore. But this has been a very uh, familiar reprise. Uh, you know, reprise here. We need the resources to make this happen. Obviously, school, but we don't want school districts to spend three times as much money as they need to to move kids uh, to and from class. Uh, we need to find uh, ways to make those. Uh, you know, those deployments as affordable as possible. And we've heard a lot about them uh, today. Uh, but one that we didn't mention is the pay as you save financing models, which is, you know, where you actually look to save money over the course of the, the vehicle's life, which you just heard is, you know, something that couldn't be longer and longer, uh, and that you pay as you go, use those kind of fuel savings to pay the capital expense. So really some smart and strategic ways to think through this, uh, to be creative. Uh, next slide. Uh, and of course, you just need to know, you know, how you're going to scale up uh, uh, these, um, you know, these deployments. So start, you know, maybe uh, like we heard in the video, maybe you actually want to do the rural longer routes because that's actually going to help you, you know, defray the cost uh, uh, and get to that, you know, 14 cents per mile versus 40 cents per mile, uh, but making sure you've got the charging infrastructure to make it happen. Next slide. Uh, and then you got to get them. Uh, and the timelines are really important to think through here. I'm sure folks, you know, paying attention, like, the Chipageddon issue means that people aren't able to just get what they want immediately. You need to think through the timelines uh, and acquire and installing the EVSE and the ESB to match things up. Uh, and if you look down there, uh, we actually have a resource that I would encourage folks to check out, uh, Drive EV Fleets, which is our climate mayor's uh, EV purchasing collaborative. Uh, which we do in partnership with some great uh, entities and which does have available a number of ESB options uh, to, you know, kind of buy in the shared collaborative to get folks a really a great price to deploy these school buses. But we know that contracts are important to consider as well. And there's some existing contracts you'll need to certainly manage. So uh, next slide. All right, so uh, the kind of that's the next step. That there is a uh, a fact sheet that we will put in the chat, uh, so you can download it yourself uh, and take it with you today after today's uh, session. But what I wanted to do before we send you off is run through just some of the amazing things we have heard. Uh, so I, you know, it's it's been uh, I just I think an amazing morning, uh, and uh, you know, kicking off with uh, with Melissa Miles, you know just really thinking through how we move forward equ uh, equitably and that it's not just an afterthought, but it is in every step of the process. Uh, and Christine Sadaboy uh, with the uh, BPU, uh, how, you know, how is, how is New Jersey moving forward? They're moving forward uh, as a, as a, on a pathway to be a leader, uh, which I think is absolutely true. And I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to a Zoom full of people from New Jersey. I think what you guys are doing nationwide is absolutely impressive. Uh, and uh, I think Pallavi had really some important information to share with us uh, and really did think through, you know, 
all the elements that are necessary to 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 ensure that you know that these ESBs are just deployed as quickly as possible, uh, but not just uh, ESBs, but the entire universe of uh, MHD or medium and heavy duty vehicles. I'm sorry, I tend to say use acronyms. Uh, so MHD is medium and heavy duty vehicles. Next slide. Uh, and of course, our leaders from the state legislature, I think, were really, uh, really wonderful, and you know, gave us a lot of uh, hope that we can get moving uh, forward as quickly as possible. Uh, and our some of our kind of corporate partners here, I think, really have been in the weeds of these deployments and are learning a lot about how to make it uh, as seamless as possible. Uh, so I, I do love that, you know, you know, the America, the business of America's business, right? So this is going to be a part of it. There have to be uh, kind of revenue sources and uh, and streams that uh, allow uh, for these deployments to, you know, uh, to to make sense from a business case, business case. And we've had some wonderful, thoughtful, creative folks who are engaged in that process. Next slide. Uh, so we're starting, we're starting, you know, we're early adopters, uh, but we are seeing the numbers begin to ratchet up, which is amazing. Next slide. Uh, I think Matt brought a really just grounded perspective on their really impressive work uh, and uh, really excited to, to see where uh, Highland kind of goes from here for sure. Next slide. Uh, 100%. Uh, Jim, I, uh, you know, Jim is somebody who I think, you know, understands the, the importance of doing this at a enormous scale and the fact that his business is committed to that as well uh, is, is, you know, again, gives me hope uh, that this is something that, uh, you know, when you've got, uh, when you've got, you know, Representative Pallone and, you know, and first student kind of on the same page looking to move forward with this uh, deployment, that's, that's where we can uh, really, I think, make some significant gains. Next slide. So uh, we just heard from Trisha doing important work in the advocacy space. And of course, you know, taking care of kids. I think, you know, again, it's mom and apple pie and school buses are absolutely things that everyone can get their head around them for a lot of reasons those little kids getting on the bus we've all seen the black plumes of pollution it is powerful it is uh, just you know un undeniable uh, in terms of a need next slide all right so um i'm going to make sure that i'm telling you what what you need right so uh we are going to break now for lunch uh, uh, and you're going to have an hour, and then we are going to come back to the new meeting link, uh, is I think what I'm, I'm telling you. Is that correct, Annie? That you're, is correct. All right. And we're I'm drop it again in the chat. Link. So it's been in the Slack. We put it in the Slack a few times. Uh, we will endeavor to email it out to registrants so everyone has it, uh, but we will be coming back right at uh, 1.30. Uh, and uh, if you're thinking, oh man, I'm just going to get some lunch and then be like, you know, dive back into my inbox, don't do it, folks. Uh, your inbox will be there when you're done. Uh, we've got some, uh, I think, really great uh, conversation queued up. Uh, and I think we can come up with some uh, implementable, realistic, useful uh, efforts that we can cumulatively kind of embrace moving forward to see uh, ESBs deployed in New Jersey uh, at, a, at a larger scale. So uh, thank everyone for their time this morning and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, at 1230.